announced this week the journey so far, far embarked upon by the government, matters arising and what the prospects are moving forward. We'll also turn our attention to the upcoming referendum on the participation of political parties in local government election processes. So question is, what is it going to be come referendum day 17 December 2019? Is it going to be a win for the yes campaign or a win for the no campaign? Now again, whether yes or no, it appears that the period leading to our first nationwide referendum since 1992 is caught up in some level of confusion. Now, a seeming lack of adequate public education is making people wonder exactly what this whole referendum is about and what their vote should be, whether a yes or a no. Now, there are those who appear to have misunderstood the objective of the referendum to be one to determine the question of whether MMDCEs should be elected. On the other hand, there are those who understand that the referendum is not to determine whether MMDCEs should be elected, but to determine whether political parties should be allowed to sponsor candidates contesting local government positions. Now for this group of persons, and I must say this is a group that we all ought to belong to if indeed the understanding or sensitization had been far-reaching, but of course there are those challenges that we'll be dealing with. Now, so the, for this last group or the latter group of people who understand exactly what the objective of the referendum is, the issue confronting them or confronting us is whether or not to have the dynamics of central government elections replicated at the local level. Now, the debate obviously, as you know, is raging and continues to rage. So on the show this morning, we shall be discussing the upcoming nationwide refer referendum the level of publicity around it, the arguments for and against the lawful involvement of political parties in local government elections, and also which position would ultimately be in the interest of Ghana to have political parties lawfully participate. And I use the word lawfully because as it is, uh, there's consensus that they are indeed participating contrary to the provisions of the Constitution. So question is, do we make it legal now or lawful? That is a big issue, and we'll be looking at that in the course of the program. So these are the two topics we've outlined for conversation this morning. We'll take a break. When we come back, we will start off with a look at the 2020 budget and matters arising. This is a key point. Stick and stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So this is The Key Points. We're live on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we'll be looking at the subject of the 2020 um, budget statement and economic policy, which was presented by the Minister uh, for Finance, Mr. Ken Ofriata, this Thursday. Um, I will be introducing the panelists very soon. But before that, let's take some snippets of his presentation in Parliament. Government will set up a national digital strategy team under the overall oversight of the presidency who will bring together local technology firms and experts and all the professional and financial support from the Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Finance, and the Ghana Investment Promotion Center to elevate the profile and reach of our digitalization strategy across the region to unlock the unexplored economic value of the sector. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurship. Government will accelerate entrepreneurship and MSC growth to support economic growth and dynamism. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurship support programs such as MBSSI and NIIP. In addition, government will facilitate linkage between domestic entrepreneurs and FDI firms to join global value chains. Mr. Speaker, recent studies conducted by the World Bank Group indicates that 200 million people worldwide disproportionately the youth are unemployed and looking for jobs. 600 million new jobs are needed globally over the next 15 years to keep employment rates stable. And 1 billion young people will enter the labor market between 20, 
2019 and 2030, the creation of jobs and connecting to markets, as well as building capabilities and connecting workers to jobs, are policy drivers for our TVET program. Mm. Mr. Speaker, government will over the medium term establish 32 new state-of-the-art TVET institutions across the country to ensure that our youth are ready for the job market. In 2018, this August House therefore approved the following tax incentives to the private sector business promoters. Five years corporate tax holiday for one year on your companies, exempting from import duties, taxes and levels on equipment, machinery and parts, exemption from payment of duties and levies on raw materials. Mr. Speaker, beyond 1D1F, the Strategic Under Industries Initiative is one of the key components of our industrial transformation plan to diversify our economy. The key strategic industries under the initiative are petrochemical, aluminum and bauxite, iron and steel, vehicle assembly, automotive industry, garment and textiles, pharmaceutical, vegetable oils and fats, industrial starch from cassava, industrial chemical based on industrial salt, machinery and equipment manufacturing. Mr. Speaker, the introduction of mobile money payments and interoperability between different telcos as well as between mobile wallets and bank accounts has been implemented. This is a major step to financial inclusion and movement towards cashless payment for government services from next year. The interoperability between mobile wallets and bank accounts that we have implemented in Ghana is the first of its kind in Africa and practically provides all 34.5 million mobile money account holders a branchless bank account. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata touted the achievement of the Kufuado led government three years in office, asserting that it has been able to deliver on its flagship programs. Assessing the 2019 fiscal year, the minister described the year as a very good one for Ghana. But Professor of Economics at the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research, Professor Peter Corte, noted the reduction of the benchmark values and the increase in tax exemptions in 2019 have proven to be counterproductive. The 2018-2019 uh, um, fiscal space has not been um, as good as one would have expected. Um, I must say that uh, if you look at the deficit, it's still within uh, five percent, um, so that that is acceptable. But um, a look at the revenue revenue numbers uh, shows that we are having a revenue shortfall. As of June, yeah. uh, we have a shortfall of about five billion uh, CDs. Yes. yes. Um, in terms of expenditure, uh, uh, I mean, if if, if uh, your revenue you don't meet your revenue targets, certainly you have to cut your quota according to your size, mm -hmm. as one may put it. So um, expenditures were also cut. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is capital expenditure that suffers. True. Um, if you look at the numbers again, you see uh, 44% mm -hmm. uh, variation or, or you know, deviation from capital expenditure target. Mm -hmm. And that is very significant. The fiscal deficit declined from 6.5% of GDP in 2016 to 4.5% at the end of the third quarter of 2019. Government says the cleanup of the entire financial sector will cost the nation's taxpayer some estimated 30 billion cities. Finance Minister Ken at the presentation of the 2020 budget statement and economic policy in Parliament today said an amount of 13 billion cities has so far been spent on the banking sector cleanup alone. The minister said figures so far suggest a more robust and resilient banking sector after the revocation of licenses of some insolvent banks and a recapitalization of the industry. Mr. Ferreta blamed the Eswell NDC administration of failing to deal decisively with the challenges that confronted the banking sector. But former Deputy Finance Minister Kesela Tuforsin said the Finance Minister was wrong. This is a Finance Minister that often comes to this Honorable House. Present a budget statement in the form of telling story and peddling propaganda and falsehood. It is wrong for a minister responsible for finance to come to this August House and ignore what his predecessors did. The very law that they are using to close down people's investment 
take down people's assets, make rendering people unemployment, were laws that we initiated. What they did was, instead of them applying that law in a positive manner, they are using the law in a negative way to destroy lives and livelihood. Mr. Forsen also criticized government's handling of the financial sector crisis. If I have 30 billion Ghana cities, I could as well bail out some of this bank, re-inject governance, save jobs, and get business. Oh, but that's not fair. Some of the banks were bailed out. They were doing well. How many of them were bailed out? UMB. How many of them? Have they got the, uh, the money? They have not gotten it. So it doesn't work. And even that, the question of some of the banks being bailed out, what was the processes of selecting? They selected those that are close to the administration, and kill those that they think are perceived that they do not belong to them. What is happening is that some of these business owners that have deposited investment in these banks, you claim that you have given money to. Where is the money? Some of them, they do not have access to this money. The financial sector cleanup includes a revocation of licenses of nine universal banks, 347 microfinance companies, of which 155 had already ceased operations, 39 microcredit companies, and money lenders, 10 of which had already ceased operations, 15 savings and loans companies, 8 finance houses, and 2 non-bank financial institutions that had already ceased operations were revoked. The Securities and Exchange Commission last week also revoked the licenses of some 53 asset management companies. Great. So that was um, a story put together in respect of the 2020 budget as presented by the finance minister, minister Mr. Ken Ofoyata, earlier on in the week. So we'll just get straight into it. And the panelists are here. From my extreme left, we have Dr. George Domfe. He's a, a development economist and he's with um, the Center for Social Policy Studies, University of Ghana. He's a senior a research fellow at that center. Next to him is Dr. Edu Owusu Sakodie. He is a research fellow at IFS. And to my right, we have Dr. John Kwekumenta Mauto. He is a dean of the School of Graduate Studies at the UPSA. And uh, last but not least is Dr. Lord Mensa. He's a senior lecturer at the UGBS, University of Ghana. Good morning, gentlemen, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Um, so we're looking at this um, very important subject of the 2020 budget and for many reasons it's a very you know important issue we're looking at indeed the finance minister himself laid out those parameters within which he presented the 2020 budget that it's an election year budget and it's coming and it's 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 going to be the first time that um, a government in an election year is going to be tested on how it's disciplines itself fiscally and uh, the um, uh, Act that has been passed, which is the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2018. And also, it's the first time since 2015 that uh, the budget that is being implemented uh, without the um, IMF support or under an IMF program. So, these really are the three, you know. Uh, dimensions or um, the, the parameters that he, the the budget of 2020 was presented within and we're going to be looking at as much as possible uh, you know a number of areas in respect of the budget and I would want to start with you Dr. Domfe here um, uh, listening to the budget an assessment of the 2018-2019 uh, or 2019 financial year if you like and looking at the budget presented for 2020 your general perspective you could just summarize maybe some three highlights you found that you could you would want us to dwell on okay thank you very much uh, for having me here again yes yeah, so um to do that uh, let me look at um, 2018 mm -hmm. in 2018 so the economy grew by 6.3 percent we were told and uh, looking at the sectors, we were told that the uh, agricultural sector and then the manufacturing uh, subsector under the industrial sector, these were the two, uh, you know, um, sectors yes. that were not uh, hitherto doing so well, that did very well. And, uh, and so that particular year's uh, growth wasn't so much driven by the oil as it used to be the mm -hmm. case in 2017. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, moving from there to 2019, I was expecting the agricultural sector and then the, the manufacturing to do well as they did in 2018. But uh, from the look of change, the data that we now have at hand indicates that um, the, the agricultural sector is not picking up as it did in, uh, in 2018 because of cocoa. And then uh, the manufacturing is not likely to grow at 9% as it did. 
yeah but and my expectation is that these two uh, you know sectors should do well uh, because that is where the poor are we are told that uh, over 70 percent of the poor in the country mm -hmm. uh, are either involved with livestock production or crop production and so if you see agricultural sector doing well then it means that you are creating wealth to cover mm -hmm. the right. poor who have been excluded for far too long mm -hmm. My other issue had to do with capital expenditure that we've all talked about. 2018, government budgeted over 7 billion on capital expenditure. And um, they, 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 taught, uh, they, they, they promised uh, uh, that uh, at least by the end of the year, they were going to construct so many roads, build so many hospitals and schools and all that. Thing. But at the end of 2018, we didn't see that. We saw that they only spent 4.7 billion because they had to sacrifice the capital expenditures for other things and that, that um, especially so when they were not getting the needed revenue mm. and they had to cut you know um, expenditure when they had to do that they rather sacrifice the expenditure that uh, they had to you know incur uh, or spend for the capital side and so that is an issue this year they have promises that uh, they are going to spend i'm, I'm, I'm talking about 20, 20. Uh, 2020 they are going to spend 9.3 my only worry is that you promise seven, you spend 4.7, mm -hmm. and now you are promising 9.3. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what is an indication that this time around you are going to spend? Maybe before we are, because we are moving into a lesson here, this time they will do that. Otherwise, they have to take very good care at that particular sector. I'm talking about the capital um, expenditure. You know, uh, um, infrastructure wise, Ghana is highly deficient. And so it's important they look at that. And when we talk about um, capital um, expenditure, it's an expenditure for tomorrow. Sure. I mean, you know, recurrent is what to eat I and mean, what to get in order to live comfortable today. Capital expenditure is about tomorrow. I do know that they are doing well when it comes to um, education, which is also about tomorrow. But then they have to look at the capital expenditure. Right. Very well. Let me turn to Dr. Um, Edu Sisakodia here and also for your initial you know, reaction to that, to the budget. But maybe just to carry on from where Doc left off talking about the capex and the spending that you know is not necessarily satisfactory. Mm. Um, I want to bring in the fact about this year or this budget being an election year and the need for government to stay within a certain deficit yeah. not to go beyond that now raising the issue about <coughs> capital expenditure obviously you're talking about infrastructure yeah. and a number of huge huge you know um activities that require you know some huge capital outlay question then is against the backdrop of the commitment that government has given that we're going to stay within this five percent cap that is statutory now yeah. and looking at the need for infrastructure in an election year. Yeah. How feasible is that commitment of government? Okay. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, since 2017, 2018, 2019 budgets, um, we've looked at revenue generation. There's always a shortfall. Now, when you read these three budgets, you, you see the reasons given for the shortfall, i.e., Taxes, you know, the shortfall is still okay. coming from international trade, income and property. Tax rate, the same things have been stated in 2017, consistently. 18, 19 yeah. consistently. Meanwhile, in the same three budgets, the minister says that we want to, you know, improve efficiency in revenue generation. And one will wonder how come that we have not been able to achieve the targets, the targets if indeed we improve the revenue efficiency. Uh -huh. Now, the other issue is that. For the last three years, 17, 18, 19, the revenue and grants have grown by just an average of 15%. Now, the projection for the medium term from 2021, 2022, and 2023 is also an average of 12%. But, only, understand. I'm coming, but only the year 2020, from 19 to 2020, <laughs> has been projected to 22%. Okay. And that is quite, you know, an alarming figure, sure. something that most of us think that we may not be able to achieve. Mm. So how do we stay within the, the fiscal deficit mm -hmm. target? One, we should be able to raise enough revenue. Once you have money, you can spend on anything that you exactly. want. So let's raise enough revenue. Number two, if we are not able to raise enough revenue, then it is very likely that the budget, the, the budget deficit target of 47 will be 
missed. Sure. It's likely that government will raise it to 5%. Very likely. Because that, that, that difference of 0.3% is going to give government about 1 billion Ghana cities, which is a huge sum of money. So if you're not able to raise the revenue, and that from all indications, we have not been able to raise revenue. This year, the first half of this year, we've missed the target yeah. by 13.6%. So then the next option is to raise the budget deficit. And I'm very sure that it will be raised. But when it but, goes to but five, we'll still be with but them. But we'll yeah. do the five. They, they, maybe they will raise it to 4.999 <laughs> <laughs> and still tell you so that. So within the five, the then, five. yeah. The next option is to cut expenditure. Right. Which is something the previous administration did not do. The previous administration, any time they missed the revenue targets, they still wanted to spend. So whilst revenue, you know, the targets was, were missed by a negative figure, the expenditure was increased by a positive figure and therefore ballooned the budget deficit. Mm. Now, this administration has insisted that they want to live within. In fact, they even passed a law. They have a Fiscal Responsibility mm. Act and they are not ready to go beyond the 5%. Mm -hmm. So the only option... If the first option revenue is not generated, the second one, and you if they can raise the bar, then they will cut the expenditure. expenditure, which is something we have seen also consistently from the year 2017, 18, 19. And I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that we are going to see the same thing in the year 2020. Irrespective so, of the fact that it's an election year and the demands for development and that's infrastructure why, that's why and everything the third will come option. in. That's why right. it's the third option. The first option is to raise revenue. Mm. The second option is to raise the budget deficit target from 4.7 to 5.0 and so get, and get, yeah, <laughs> and get that 1 billion difference. Mm -hmm. mm. And that 1 billion can do so many things mm. for them during the election year. Mm. The third option is to cut the, the, the sum of the expenditure. And obviously what comes to mind first is the capital expenditure. Reasons, reasons being that they have, they have maintained their consistency. And I, I like that. I like that. They have maintained their consistency of you know ensuring that they implement the flagship programs and understandably so because they're politicians why not because they campaigned Ghanaians voted for them so they have a medium term plan for the four years and right from the word go in the year 2017 they have stated all the flagship programs mm -hmm. and they have been repeated in all the all the budgets that they are going to make sure that they achieve the targets so whatever it take it will take them to achieve the flagship programs and most of the flagship programs are recurrent expenditure in nature. Right. So they will, by all means, cut the capital and then maintain focus. I like the way they maintain focus on the, on the flagship programs. Mm. And an MP will say, okay, the one million one constituent hasn't come. But, but to a large but, extent, but yeah, they've to, been able to... Sure, to the know, extent that yeah. we, we do appreciate that the, the capital expenditure, I mean, that is for the future, like you know, Dr. Domfer said, and perhaps it's, it's worth and putting money into yeah. as against the recurrence which yeah. we're looking at yeah. the if you like the social intervention yes, 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 the, yes, exactly yes. those flagship programs mm. question then is have we in the past three years realized any if you like positive impact from these flagship programs to say that well even if we are cutting down on you know capital expenditure to allow us yeah. do this yeah. it's worth yeah. doing it's worth doing it's worth doing let me let me give you the the structure of the economy hasn't changed significantly to create the needed jobs in fact the gdp growth rate about 50 percent of the gdp growth rate is coming from the extractive sectors and the extractive sectors are capital intensive mm -hmm. in nature so we have not been able to create the needed jobs what people are looking for are the needed jobs and the one they say one factory two we haven't even reached half so what then do you do you need the social intervention programs to relieve uh. Ghanaians of the burden uh -huh. that it will be on them. Uh -huh. Because now you haven't created enough jobs. So you, you intervene uh -huh. and relieve the burden. That is the first, the first argument for social intervention program. The second argument is inclusive growth. In the past, you read a theory, developmental theory, and say that grow your GDP and expect that it will trickle down to exactly. those at the bottom level. Now the dynamics have changed. We are looking at the bottom-up approach where you empower the poor and the vulnerable at the bottom uh -huh. and make sure that they, they participate 
in the growth process. When we were young, we had this NCNC, no contribution, no job. <laughs> so so you, you, you empower them mm. to contribute to the growth process, and therefore you can in, enjoy. In this free SHS, people have argued against. I have always maintained my position. I have supported it. I will continue to support it. Why? Because if you have 15% of, of Ghanaians having up to just, uh, you know, SHS and above education. And then in the labor force, in the labor force, those you expect to grow your GDP, only 20% have higher education. So 80% do not have up to, you know, SHS. Uh -huh. And this is a shame for a middle-income economy. A middle-income uh -huh. economy. Uh -huh. it's, it's something right. shameful. Right. So as for free SHS, I will support it. If you are saying that it's so, you don't buy the argument about it being, uh, you know, the need to revise it to make it more targeted, which would then be, you know, what is targeted? What well. is targeted? Because <laughs> those saying we'll targeted look, uh -huh. are saying that the rich must be made to pay. Yes. Right now, we don't have data for that. And secondly, secondly, if we even if we had data, I would not support that because the tax system in Ghana is progressive. Right. So already well, we, the rich definitely, that are paying the taxes. Sure. I mean, well, the free SHS issue is something I flagged here for discussion yes. later yes, on. Yes, so we'll come to that. We'll come that. to social arguments. We'll come to that very well, <laughs> and then we'll take the sides of that and um, the, the other co uh, panelists as well. But still on, um, Dr. Malto, still on the government flagship programs and and, and the need for government to, like Dr. Usisakonye said that. Perhaps, yes, it's a prudent thing for them to focus on their flagship program because this is yeah. what they campaigned on. Yeah. There's that other side of the argument that, yes, well, like I already posed to him, there's a need to also invest in capital, you know, expenditure, yeah. Yeah. which is ultimately going to, you know, transform, you know, the economy and, and, and what have you. But even limiting the argument within the flagship programs, let's look in uh, Appendix 6 of, of the budget, you know, it has the cost of government flagship programs. Yeah. And if you look at it and the figures allocated for the respective flagship programs. You can get a sense of where government's priority is. I mean, if you look at, for instance, the One District, One Factory Initiative, which, f I mean, if you listen to the, the, the people when they talk, the experts, One District, One Factory, and somebody like Dr. Domfer would always say that he is very excited by this because of the impact it has or the likely impact it can have on the economy. But look at the figure there. You have 150 million, 810, uh, is it thousand? I believe that's it. Yeah. And then as against um, livelihood empowerment against poverty, which is giving money into people, in people's hands directly, that is 200 million. Clearly, LEAP is over and above 1D1F. Yeah. What, what, what does that say to you when you look at this? And again, there are a number of examples I could go on as, as we go along to show that there's a certain, you know, priority mindset in here. So whereas 1D1F has a certain level of transformational potential, if you like, we are not spending as much as we need to, but we're doing more on LEAP, which is you're not going to get anything really from LEAP apart from you know, putting money in people's hands. What are you going to get beyond that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to extend my greetings to your viewers. Um, I think you've, you've, you've probably started on a very good note by asking such questions in that for the past three years, if you check the trend of government expenditure with projections as well as, as, well as actuals, um, it's, it's, it's imperative to note that um, it's the, the the expenditure is more of consumable mm. oriented consumable focused in that if um you always have your capital expenditure reduced um sacrifice for your uh, recurrent expenditure in fact i i want to disagree with my colleague who mentioned that uh, it's good that uh, the government cuts capital expenditure and concentrates on their social intervention program. Please, it has serious implications. Um, in as much as um, um, a government, you know, providing and intervening socially to help its citizens, I think we should also focus on, in fact, um, resourcing them from their labor. You know, the issue of spending on your capital expenditure it provides jobs as well. It expands your economy. Um, in fact, if, if the government spends so much and want to distribute income, then I expect that um, 
when you construct roads in my area, when you construct schools in my area, um, the, 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 the vulnerable who are looking for jobs will automatically go and offer them their services to the government and then as well as make their necessary I mean, uh, income from that. However, I wouldn't begrudge the government so much in, in, in here, but the figures are alarming. Could you imagine that, um, I mean, over the past three years, consistently, uh, the wage bill is hovering around 30%, the wage bill. Um, the, the, the interest we pay for 20, 2020, we are talking about capital expenditure of 10.8% against, I mean, the wage bill of 31%. So it tells you the direction a government is going. But the, on the now, wage bill, what, mm -hmm. what, 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 what practically can the government do? I mean, the, the, you need to pay. You need to pay these yeah, people. So yeah. what, what really can can be done about that? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so in fact, it tells you that there there should be a paradigm shift mm. by developing the private sector. You see, this is even in fact the target for the wage bill. To be frank with you, um, looking at the posture of uh, the labor union. The government may, not, may even overspend because the doctors are. <laughs> the yeah, are oh yeah, oh yeah. The, the, the doctors are striking, and I, I learned um, they, they have been off. spoken to and all that. However, you see, um, when you are too much consumable focused, it has serious implication for economy. And at the end of the day, apart from the social implications, you also have the the fiscal implication. What are we telling the youth? Yes, I agree with you. Picking a figure, if you have a, a, a flagship program like one district, one factory, and the budget, your projection towards that uh, program is 151 against providing for livelihood of, of, of over 200 million, 200 million for livelihood. It tells you where you are going, where the focus is. But I can tell you that one of the reasons why most connoisseurs in both academy, uh, the, the academia and as well as the financial industry uh, or sector were so much enthused with this one district, one, fa uh, one, one, one factory program has to do with the provision of job for the people. So if it is your focus, then we expect that the government should provide more of its resources in this area. Um, what this means is that... Um, we, 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 we are ready to share more of our resources to the needy than to provide for them, which they, they, they have the option to probably use their, their labor, provide or, or put their labor at the expense of, of, of the jobs to, 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 to make their livelihood. Now, one alarming um, figure here that most people are not really taking into consideration the development of the transportation system, the railway industry. Mm. In fact, we, I'm one of the few ones who were so much interested in the fact that the government, with its you know, motive to develop the railway industry, set up a railway ministry yes. purposely to, to, to develop this, this particular And that, that has a budget of 117. 117 that million. also less than the, 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 the leap. This is, this, this is a capital intensive project. Mm. I don't know the, the, the extent to which they've gotten to with their plans, but I can tell you if the railway sector is developed, mm -hmm. it has several implications. Mm. In fact, it's going to help our housing industry. The last time I traveled to Pram Pram, and um, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I when I saw the, 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 the project, the Seglema projects, I asked myself, in fact, if there was an effective railway system that probably travels about 20 meters even away from that place. Some of us will move from Accra mm. to these places. The railway sector is a place that provides jobs for the people. I think the projection, I don't know whether this one for 171, 117 one million for, for the railway sector is just to probably continue with the feasibility studies or, 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 or what, but it's a capital intensive area where you need more money into this area. Mm. Probably we have to, uh, I mean, deal. De de we we'll need mean, to know exactly what it's going what, what, into, what, what perhaps. What goes yeah. into that? Okay. Let me go, yes. All right. if, I, I, if you're done, quickly to Dr. Lord Mensah here. And again, looking at the key, key question of revenue. Now, when you look at the budget, I mean, the minister indicated that to consolidate the gains achieved within the last three years, 
um, government intends to embark on, you know, some agenda uh, to drive the economic transformation forward in line with what he says the president's consolidated program and the Ghana Beyond Aid vision. Now in there, they talk about domestic revenue mobilization, business regulatory reforms, intensified drive for FDI. And when you go through, you realize that, of course, these are really nothing new. And I believe Dr. Obusu Sakode alluded to that fact that, for instance, in terms of revenue, you know, we, we set targets, we consistently are not able to achieve the targets. And question then is, is it the question that we are not factoring in certain, you know, relevant, if you like, factors that ought to be considered when setting these targets? We, I, do, I do want to believe that obviously we are not setting the targets in a vacuum. So if we are considering, for instance, the taxable population, for which reason we can project realistically, then what is the difficulty in, when it comes to you know, these things. And why consistently we repeat some of these measures that we say we are going to do to consolidate the gains made and all of that. Yeah, very good. Um, and uh, let me wish our viewers very well. If you look at, uh, let me touch on some of the few things, sure. um, you, you, you questions that you asked them. And uh, if you look at the um, budget deficit of 4.7 that has been projected, um, if we are to go by the numbers, clearly, it's more than 5.0 percent. The reason why I'm saying it does is that our GDP has been rebased. So whatever you know number that you are relating to a GDP, you should know that we have an increased GDP. Mm. If we are to go by the old GDP, then we are doing more than five percent. So effectively, we are doing more than five percent. That's according to the old. According to but the if we're working with the new, then yes. If you are working with the but new, so if, then, if there's a new then system, then we work you, with the new. You project with sure. a four point seven. Mm. But let me clearly also say that this generally this budget more or less <laughs> seems to be like a budget that is overconfidence. I mean, more or less looking at likely revenue that we can have, mm -hmm. and then pro projections of expenditure sure. that we can have. Now, if you look at the gap between the revenue that has been projected and then the expenditure, last year we projected around 13 point something billion. This year it is about 18 point something billion. Now, I will say that history does not favor us in achieving this, you know, target. Also, you ask why are we spending so much on LIP than 1D1F? I would say it is strategic because government in its own wisdom knows very well that if you are to invest more in 1D1F, the people will not feel it, it within that four years. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, if you want the people to feel what you are doing, you have to give them the money direct. And that is why I presume that the LEAP is what has been allocated more funds than the 1D1F. And is that not the reason why perhaps we are still where we are at? No, hold we on. We always let, talk about I'm, industrialization, I'm but we never question. get it let to me, that let point. Me, let me sure. answer your question. Sorry for, 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 for <laughs> preempting your thoughts there. Doc also mentioned that the government is spending more on... Uh, less on capital expenditure, more on interest payment. That is not something that the government can do anything about. Mm -hmm. Do you know when Ghana shot its foot on paying more interest than its expenditure, uh, capital expenditure? At the point where we saw that our debt was growing to a level where it is not going into projects that can be self-financing, that was when we shot our foot. And let me tell you that any country or any organization or any institution that fails to invest in capital expenditure mm. is killing its future. Mm. And straight on, Ghana is killing its future. So I will tell you that our hands are tied. Interest is an obligation. You cannot avoid paying your interest. Otherwise, you'll be declared bankrupt. And you can never go anywhere to go and borrow again. Now, let me relate that to the current budget, the 18 point something that has been declared as deficit that needs to be financed. You realize that clearly the government intends to borrow about 10 point something million, billion 
from the outside world and 8 billion in house. Now, that 8 billion that is going to be borrowed in house, I tell you, has a tendency of you know, not bringing up the private sector. Because looking at the situation now, and the banking sector, and then all those fa um, uh, fund management, and all those you know, microfinance, uh, you realize people have more confidence in government than a private man. Or even the banks. So they'd rather lend to them and crowd out. Yes, the exactly. That is the, it has to happen. There's no way, because the rational investor, there's no way rational investor will give his money to, uh, I mean, a private man when he knows very well that there's an uncertainty. And obviously, government will be a safe haven. But so the coming to the market, like the cleanup has led to a more the market, it has, has, it has but remember, 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 the investor is still not certain. As we speak now, it has not died out yet. No, no. Because people are going to be persecuted. More revelations are going to come out. I was thinking when we started, within a time period of 82 years, we would have finished everything. And then by this time, the system is cleared. And whoever is hesitating to send his money to the bank within six months, maybe would have settled and said, okay, fine, I want to invest now. Think two years is too short a period for such a magnitude of Now, let me, let me not run away from your question. You see, <laughs> <laughs> it is clear on the ground that we keep on spending on revenue mobilization or revenue enhancement mechanisms. We've been investing. If you talk about ident national identification card, it's one of the ways of enhancing our revenue mobilization. If you talk about paperless port investment, it's one of them. Now, but the question we need to ask ourselves is that when we declare expenditure for a project, right, what percentage of the real, you know, um, cost or what percentage of the funding that goes into the project? Because there are leakages. Okay. And so, those expenditures that we've been incurring to enhance revenue mobilization are not yielded. They're not yielded. That is why, for the past three years, if you look at measures mm -hmm. that is being put in place to ensure that we have, you know, um, we have a revenue target. We are appear not, the same. We appear the same. Right. Well, this, let's, I think and this, this particular to budget, yeah. let me land here, mm -hmm. and this particular budget, you could see clearly that everything that has been settled on to, you know, enhance revenue mobilization has been a review of existing structures. Mm. And when you review, trust me, the impact might not be felt immediately. Sometimes all the reviews, the impact will be felt not in that the next year's sure. budget. We're looking at maybe two years, three mm -hmm. years to come. Mm -hmm. So when we are projecting, right, we have to be careful and be a, a bit realistic in terms of our projection. Right. Because I know, even though I know very well that most of the time, the budget is driven by more politics than the economic fundamentals. If it's it, politics, it, it is then it be, it's overly it's a political optimistic. document, yes. isn't it? It's, it's more political. Of course, you cannot dissociate politics from economics. Manifesto, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So years. definitely it's Every driven by that. But it's based on the manifesto. Sure. Can I touch on the capital? Sure. We, we need to take a break. And okay. when we come back, I'll definitely come to yeah. you for you know, your reaction to that, as well as Dr. Domfer. So this is the key point. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're currently looking at the 2020 budget as presented by the Finance Minister, Mr. Kendo Ferriata, earlier on in the week. And the panelists in studio are um, Dr. George Domfe. Uh, we also have Dr. Edu Ouzusa Kodie and Dr. John Kweku Mensa Mauto and Dr. Lord Mensa giving their perspectives um, on the budget. Uh, Dr. Edu, yeah, you I wanted, wanted to. to on the capital yes. expenditure. You're saying why the not, craze no, about I'm that? Kidding. I am not against capital expenditure. Okay. Capital expenditure is good for any economic transformation. You need it. Sure. The roads must be constructed. You need railway. You need airport. You need them. But when your resources are limited in economics, you make your choice. 
the school of preference, and this government campaign on the flagship programs, and they have to deliver. So when you, you have to, this is what we call the policy choice. Now, do you want your road to be fixed or you want your child to go to school free? It's a choice that you have to make. You need a blend of... Um, no, no, we need... And I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm developing an argument. I'm developing an argument. I'm coming. Yes, I'm coming. Coming. he's developing an argument. Allow him. I'm developing an argument. Yes. I'm developing an argument. Everybody wants the two. Right. Everybody wants the two. But when your resources are limited, you make a choice. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And, and what is capital? In, in any case, what is capital? When you put up a building, that is capital expenditure. But when you have to renovate it, it becomes recurrent. Sure. So, so you put up a lift in a building, you have to repair that lift, it becomes goods and service, it becomes your recurrent. In any case, education is also human capital. Now, why I was so obsessed with this capital expenditure until, until we did a research at IFS. So I can understand where my, my senior brothers are coming from. When we did the research at IFS, we took a data in the Fourth Republic from 1993 to 2016 or 2017. And what did we find? The correlation between non-oil GDP and capital expenditure was negative over the period. The correlation between macroeconomic stability, i.e. inflation and city depreciation, was 0 0.8. What is correlation? Correlation means when this one moves that way, this one should also move that way. It means that when macroeconomic stability moves 1%, the impact or the, uh, the non-oil GDP was also moved by 0.8%. Mm. And that is positive. And that is why I understand. And this is the evidence. This is the evidence. When the previous administration was also so obsessed with capital, with capital expenditure, expenditure mm. and they were constructing roads with infrastructure, what was the GDP growth rate that they left the country with? 3.4%. Now, this administration has sacrificed capital expenditure has maintained macroeconomic stability. And the evidence is that we have average 7%, average 7%. So, so this, the evidence that I have with you, it also reinforces the results that we got from our, our, our research that capital expenditure do needed. The, the major contributory factor to non-oil GDP growth is macroeconomic stability. Mm. And macroeconomic stability we have enjoyed for the past three years. And I'm happy that the 2020 budget is going to maintain the focus to sustain the macroeconomic stability. Right. So, I so I, I am not I against my capital. Doctor, capital no, just a minute. I, I think I we'll definitely need to move beyond this. Yeah. We'll definitely <laughs> need, no, please, just a minute. We'll definitely need to move beyond this capital expenditure, you know, because I, it looks like we are getting yeah. fixated on that. But, <laughs> yes, but we need to, but you, you made a point, and I think we need to interrogate that, and I'll, I'll take that to Dr. George um, Domfe. You know, there's been the argument that, well, you talked about the previous administration. Yeah, Obviously, the yes, they were big on, yeah. uh, you know, infrastructure and all. Yeah. There's the argument that, well, perhaps it didn't translate into what we expected it to be because of the cost of that yes. and the fact that perhaps there were some... having the benefits. Yes, that, but the cost of it itself perhaps was overly, you know, if you like, bloated. bloated. Exactly. And so that, that's why you don't necessarily see that nexus. Exactly. So it's not necessarily the case that there is, you, you know. Spend on exactly. And you look, if, if you could and touch on that. Example. Let me give you an example. In, in 30 seconds. Yeah, in 30 let me seconds. go to George Dumfrey. When, Dr. Dumfrey, when sorry. in the previous administration, I am not criticizing them, but mm -hmm. I'm, making, I'm stating a fact. When they were investing in infrastructure, the construction subset was going negative. Mm. What is infrastructure? You build road, you construct road, you construct buildings. Meanwhile, construction was going negative. Right. Good. Yeah, um, so, so, so let me uh, just pick it from where. And that'll be the last on capital expenditure. We have to be very careful. When we are talking about capital expenditure, it has never been so good. Sometimes when we talk, we, we appear to suggest that some few years back we were doing so well. In fact, the, the exceptional case was 2016, yeah. when we spent $7 billion on capital expenditure. It has always been around 5%, right? And so if you also spent, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, $5 billion. Mm. And, and so if you look at the average for the last few years, and average for the last 10 years, you don't see anything significant you know, I'm significantly different. different. Apart from 2016. Uh, exactly, apart from 2016. So, um, 2016, 
was seven An billion. Exceptional year, if exactly. Like. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're going to see this year. This year they are saying nine point three. And hopefully we may we we, we may hit their seven. Mm -hmm. You know, so capital expenditure has always been low. It's, 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 and we have always been crying, we have always been shouting. Of course, the previous administration, we saw flamboyant, you know, I mean, projects. And so sometimes when you see the, the circle, uh, the Dubai thing, you tend to think that everything was well with every part of the country. If that was so, we shouldn't be crying today over rules and all those things. Again, um, there's something I want to quickly um, comment on, mm -hmm. the y, 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 1D, 1F. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, government is not spending uh, and then money going there is not enough. Uh, we Compared must, to other we, we must get programs. to that uh, it is more of a private sector led, you know, I mean, program. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I mean, th that 150 million Ghana cities that you're talking about is mainly going to, you know, help assist them in, in, in getting loans, uh, land, and, you know, they have, uh, and government has uh, extended to which word it, it goes into this particular. I mean, program. We, 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 uh, because of the what history teaches us, in the 1960s, Kwame Nkrumah had uh, 79 factories, all by, uh, or, I mean, owned by state, and we didn't see any you know, results thereafter. So now we want to empower individuals to own the factories. And so the 1DF, one fact, uh, I mean, one policy, one yeah, that we're talking about, is not for government. Government is just helping them to you know, I mean, individual business people to set it up. And so the capital, the huge capital and um, actually the intensive, the, um, whatever that they are spending, is mainly coming from the, I mean, individuals. Government is just, um, as I said, helping them not uh, in getting loans and, you know, getting some other things, not, not to spend directly on the, I mean, um, the factories as... But, 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 but well, I, well, I, I, that's granted, but also... Get, shouldn't you be seen to be, you know, putting some substantial amount into the sector to indicate the kind of, you know, um, priority you put on that particular sector or with this particular flagship program? Yes. And, 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 and this is, no, I'm not taking it in a vacuum. I'm looking at it as against other, other flagship programs. <laughs> yeah, so for this particular one, as I've said, that is our future. We are talking about capital expenditure as our future. I also see uh, man, uh, manufacturing sector equally as our future, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, uh, that is where we create jobs. Exactly. And uh, when the finance minister was talking, he talked about the fact that in the next 10 years, uh, 1 billion youth are going to roam about with that job in the world. And, then, and when you look back to our backyard here, it is almost happening. We, all, mm -hmm. we always have over 300,000 roaming about with that work every year. And now we have to spend so 840 it, million important. on NAPCO, for instance, because of this kind of situation. Yeah. We now need to find jobs. And, and unfortunately, for these that people. might not even be sustainable because after and three years, they're coming. Uh, and so you need to build the I mean, uh, economy to even uh, expand enough to. Exactly. I mean, you know, uh, so after three years, so they can get somewhere to go uh, instead of going back to sit home. Uh, uh, right. and continue, continue from where they were. Right. And so manufacturing sector is very, very I mean, important. important. And I like what is happening. Uh, the, uh, there are a, a lot of things government must do. One of it had to do with the I mean, policy rate, that, that balloon to 27%, and uh, I'm happy to be the second highest in um, Africa. We, we, we clearly were better than I mean, Namibia. You know, but 20, 20, I mean, 2016, it has dropped to 25.5%. Today, it has come to 16%. But, but there is a problem. In as much as uh, the drop is huge, uh, more than 10 percentage points, we, sh we are not seeing the lending rate coming down to reflect the, the huge, I mean, decline. <coughs> and uh, so lending, every lending rate has gone down from How about 35 percent to about 25. Mm -hmm. And that is expected because it's not only the policy rate that drives that agenda. And so the president calls that they should cut the lending rate. It's, it's, it's a right step. I mean, you know, the policy rate yeah. Is the but then, driver. yeah, but then it is not only driver. policy rate. And the banks are out there to make profit. Mm. You know, they ha they pay their people, mm. and so they consider quite a number of things apart from the policy rate. And so uh, we need to maybe uh, get to understand that, and government maybe needs to set for them those other things. How do we address them? You know, the bank risk ratio and all those. And mm -hmm. how do we address them so that the lending rate will also come down? It's when it comes down that. People in businesses are going to expand, and those who haven't even made up their minds to enter would be encouraged to go and all open up businesses. And that is how 
we can move from where right. we are. Very well. Um, let's switch to this other aspect of the conversation where we, government is saying that there's going to be, um, here I'm looking at paragraph 228 of the budget where it's talking about changing the environment for private sector credit delivery. Mm -hmm. And that's where the talk about, you know, the National Development Bank and the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund come in. I mean, there's, there's the concern <coughs> that perhaps this is going to be an add-on to what we already have, which necessarily isn't yielding results that we, 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 we ultimately want to see in terms of having policy banks like the ADB, uh, the NIB, and if you, if you could even add it, the Exim Bank. As in, currently, these have their specific focus areas, but perhaps not necessarily you know, getting the results that we desire. So if you bring this in, yes, it may be a laudable um, um, suggestion or measure to take, but practically, what are we to get from it? What is going to be the, 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 the change? What are we going to derive from this? Thank you, Abba. I think um, um, in as much as I want to move straight to this particular you argument, want to I, just, I just want to Tell me it's explain not capital myself. Expenditure. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. It does. You see, um, <laughs> let's get this right. We are not saying that uh, capital expenditure is everything. Okay. Irrespective of your improvement in your agricultural sector, if the roads are not constructed, a simple transportation from a front plains to Accra would add additional costs to your products. There might be a number, I mean, huge bumper harvests, but the roads may not be good to transport them to the market. We have several post-harvest losses through bad roads. We are talking about capital expenditure. Every economy, every developed economy develops its capital projects. In fact, it is an investment project by itself. That is it. Mm. Now, let me come back to the financial sector. Um, I think I've been one of the few who have always never um, want the government to go into establishing additional banks. Look, if you want a policy, I mean financial institution, you already have two major ones, in fact, three major ones, GCB, ADB, NIB. It behoves on the government, the majority shareholder, to see how best they can review their structures. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about credit today, one of the areas I don't know what is happening to the politicians has to do with the, I mean, the real estate industry. The way and manner we are paying lip service to this sector. I do not know whether they've really considered it very well. Yes, it's established that we have a deficit in our housing you know, sector. Today, I would have been happy if the government is going to establish a bank, I mean a mortgage uh, 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 institution to assist the youth in getting shelter. Today, the average Ghanaian the middle class. How many of us can even afford affordable houses they are talking about? <laughs> but I can tell you, if, if I have um, um, a, a four bedroom or two bedroom where I can pay, I, I buy it over 20 years, I think I will not go and, and be struggling over any land with a landlord to probably build um, for the sake of providing shelter for my family. However, this sector is so booming. In fact, every every industry, every economy, mostly strive on the on the on the real estate, you know, sector. The the, the Ghanaian real estate sector has not yet been developed. So, if I expect the government to probably come out with a bank, then I think we should be looking at a bank purposely to finance real estate. Now, coming back to the financial industry, how to redirect and probably develop the financial industry. Um, probably that will move us to what is happening in the, in the banking sector. Um, to be frank with you, Abna, um, what has happened over the past few years, I will always mention, um, I want to agree with my colleague here, Doc, that the spillover effect of the insolvent banks, um, if, if, if we don't tackle it now, in the next few months to come, I think we may probably face more problems than what we find ourselves in today. Yeah. Practically, 
um, the government should be looking at devoting more than $1.5 billion for a bailout. The bailout you're talking about is not a normal um, recurrent bailout of liquidity. We are talking about bailout to even preserve existing financial institutions. Now, figures are, I mean, on a daily basis, you, 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 you have contradictory figures, some coming from SEC, some coming from the government institutions, as to the total loss of even the last 53 collapsed uh, fund management um, firms. I, I, I can tell you that um, uh, in the fund management um, uh, institutions, they, they manage a chunk, a chunk of not only the retail investment sector, yeah, but well. institutional yeah. investment funds. Institutional yeah. investment funds, we are talking about insurance companies, we are talking about even existing banks, both universal and other financial institutions in there. Yeah. And if we, are, if, we, if we are estimating the cost, the cost of these uh, losses to be around 9 billion Ghana cities, which somebody says is even more than the Sino Hydro money <laughs> we are talking about, 9 billion Ghana cities. Let's assume that 50% of that uh, is from the um, institutional investors like the existing insurance mm -hmm. firms as well as uh, the, some banks. What's going to happen is that next year, if they are not built out, some of them have to go down. Well, still within the financial sector, I go to Dr. Ron Menza here <laughs> quickly. <laughs> your, what, your question is worth, you know, uh, um, um, pondering over. And as we do that, still, I, I still, you know, keep us within that whole financial sector um, um, and clean up thing in the aftermath. It's estimated that about 16 billion cities have so far gone into, you know, this whole uh, clean up process. And I think what people are trying to understand is exactly what it went into and in terms of recoveries questions are also rife as in for instance how how far have we been able to recover you know what are the amounts involved in there no we're just trying to understand exactly what this amount of money has gone into any ideas well um, if you look at the financial space I mean, let me take this opportunity to address some few highlights before I come to that. You know, um, my stream left uh, colleagues. You two of you on the stream the side, and you're throwing the yes, uh, there. <laughs> Mention, um, I think uh, the west side is the east uh, side. Doc, Doc, Doc mentioned about uh, policy, policy, policy rate not being the only driver, driver of yeah. the um, interest rate on the market. I will, I will differ on that mm. because um, we used to have a base rate which was mainly driven by the bank's specific indicators. Now there was a change to that. We went to Ghana reference rate, which the main indicators are the monetary policy rate and then treasury bills rate. So uh, I differ on that. Now let's, let me come to Dr. Sarkodie. Which you're entitled to, I mean. Let me come to mm -hmm. Dr. Sarkodie's uh, issue on the correlation between the CAPEX. Can, can, can mm -hmm. And then, the hold on, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, hold on. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the time. The, the, you the, may, the, yeah. The, 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 just note the, it down, yes. Yeah. Carry on, please. The, 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 CAPEX, <laughs> the CAPEX and then the uh, correlation with the GDP growth. I don't know how they computed that. But trust me, if you are computing them contemporaneously, if you spend now you don't expect the impact now mm -hmm. the impact on the economy they did will it over a period yeah, it, will, it, will it be was over a period, period. Four so they had years. a so, so hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. so so you don't it's expect that we don't expect that it will you know you have that contemporaneous it's correlation but, but, but then so, that's what he's pointing uh, that's what he's pointing you to that it was over a period of 24 years you don't think that isn't a good time it wasn't let me it wasn't let me let me come to my my you don't have anything scientific to rebut that they have done something scientific methodological Issue. That's but that's fine. Carry on. Okay, okay. This is a real issue. Okay, that's okay. No, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Just a minute. Let me let me let me let me let me come to your question. One at a time, please. One at a time. Let me come to your question. Let me come to your question. You see, 16 billion cities as a bailout to those banks. Now the banks had deposits, which were liabilities, right? Anticipation that those liabilities could have been converted to assets, which would be the loans that they give out and all those. But those did not come as a result of failure. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this 16 billion 
will go to pay this deposit. But the question is whether the depositor will get his principal with the interest accrued over the years. That's the question. Now, all these banks and all those uh, microfinance have been ceded up to a receiver, right? And those, that receiver needs to pay off these depositors' funds. Mm -hmm. The 60 billion went in there. But the question is, was the 16 billion earmarked for this uh, exercise? Couldn't we have channeled it in a different way to ensure that at least we keep the structure of the financial space and still change the possible you know, uh, management or possible owners, and in the end, we'll have the system running as it's supposed to be. So saying that should have Rather been than been... going by that military approach of crashing company here and there, crashing institutions here and there. Why do you call it a military approach of crashing? They were, comp they were, they were working with a law. And you, the, the players Abra, in there were expected to Abra, Abra, comply with the law. They were found to have violated the who law. Who made those laws? Are we not the only the ones who made those laws? The laws could have been modified. So as we go, we change the laws see, just to Abra, let me tell and you not one deal let with the situation. There's a law, right? Let me give you a typical example. That says that don't urinate in this hall. Right? Now, common sense also tells you that we can also, in the midst of people, don't do that. Do you get it? So forget about the law. But once you, Let's look once at you, the, once you the, do the, the act which scenarios. is prohibited, no, we, we, are, yeah, we are all doing analysis. Changes. We yeah. can just project and play mm -hmm. scenarios. I mean, now let's look at the various scenarios where we could have saved the situation, possibly without necessarily having that huge impact in distorting the financial space as it stands now. Okay? Now that 16 billion as a bailout could have been used to buy shares in some of these companies that are grounded, right? And still have, be part of the decision-making body, where government with taxpayers' money still be part of the decision-making body. Now, this 16 billion is taxpayers' money. Or you don't see it that way. It's taxpayers' money. And that is going into uh, this, the, 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 those pay bailout. Now, what is the interest of the taxpayer in these institutions that we are bailing out? Who is representing the taxpayer? So we could have, you know, find a way to pump this money. Most of those companies were frozen at the upper part of their balance sheet. They were not liquid. So use your liquidity, pump in this money, right? And then hold up some ownership. After pumping, and after in, after pumping the ownership, in, you become a part owner. After injecting capital in and seeing that capital go to waste, you inject. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You don't, you don't, you don't inject don't, capital don't, by not following up. When you provided the liquidity support to those banks, mm -hmm. what did you do? You just provided it. Did you know that that liquidity support was still taxpayers' money? So what was the representative of the taxpayer mm. on those companies, Capital Bank and all those? Very well. Did let we me see that? Let me bring we in the, 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 the views so for me, of the you viewers You asked of whether the three additional banks and all those uh, exim uh, banks uh -huh. were needed or not. To uh -huh. to uh -huh. I will so, do that. So, yes. so effectively... Not exim banks, the National Development Bank. The National Development Bank. See, Abuna, we have a history. Let's not forget... 30 seconds, you finish, because I need to... You have just 30 seconds. You know, used to operate... You mm -hmm. know, bank specific lines where banks are channeled to a particular mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. agenda. Same. Where we used to have bank for housing and construction, mm -hmm. you know, agriculture bank, mm -hmm. national investment ADB. bank, mm -hmm. and all those. They were channeled purposely for a purpose. Then in the 1990s, we came by adapting that universal banking, banking law. Yeah. And by so doing, banks started operating as investment banks. And then at the same time, what? Commercial, commercial banks. banks. So, what prevents an investment bank to make investment? Do you get it? What prevents an investment bank to go into construction? What prevents an investment bank to provide funds into real estate sector? Those are their decisions to make. Those we are, are talking investment. about. But do you know what happened? Banks set up by the I'm state you, for me, certain purposes. Don't cut me out. Let me I'm just, finish I'm just, my I'm statement. Just, Enhancing the conversation. Okay, that's then. Right. That's <laughs> fine. You see, then suddenly we adapted this uh, universal banks situation. Now, in the end, banks were investing, but most banks were concentrating their loan 
to government-tied activities, mm. giving loans to contractors, highly concentrating their loans, forgetting that banking is about diversifying your loans. Yeah. Giving it out to contractors, somebody will tell about 60% of his loans yeah. are contractors who are working for the government. Right. Knowing very well that there's something we call political risk, which can happen anytime there's a regime change. Very well. I will, I will have um, Dr. Domfe react to you know, um, what you said in respect oh. of something he has said. But before that, I'll bring right. in the views of our listeners and viewers. They are an important part of this. So this one is coming. It says, good morning, Abena. The man who talked about free SHS relating it to progressive tax and the rest has gotten it wrong. Even the finance minister said it's unwise for him to take his child to school and would not pay fees when he can pay for more than 10 students. Um, Ajmal in Kumbungu says, please Abna, uh, ask Dr. Lord Mesa to tell me the difference between the budget as was read by the finance minister in a political party manifesto as the national budget is always used to carry out programs and policies in party manifestos. Um, this, comp this one says, this is Koshi Baduhu in Denu. He says, this comparison of growth and economic index indices in percentage and absolute terms can be deceptive. Percentage is a function of base. If you inherit an economy of $100 and you add $20, that is 20% growth. If another government inherited the $120 economy and added $23, that translates to 19% growth, even though that government has added more. Inflation, interest rate, exchange rate, debt to GDP ratio, and all other economic indices are not targets. They are neutral, adjustable economic management tools. The most important thing is context. Do you agree with this statement? Yeah. <laughs> I'm throwing it to you guys. And that's Koshi Badohu in Denu. Uh, this one also says, good morning, Abner and your panelists. God bless you all for the intellectual discourse today. Hashtag, that's Solomon Budumburam. Um, good morning, Abner. If the man is suggesting that targeting of free SHS is not good, why are we doing leap school feeding, etc.? Okay, that goes to you, Dr. Moses. <laughs> I think. Well, another one coming in says, the economic policies and programs of the NPP in its first four years is simply election-winning oriented economics. Give the mass of the people money. Uh, to eat and and court their support for 2020. The economic statistical figures are massaged to impress and keep the NPP in power for another four years, but practically the economic future of Ghana is bleak. That's divine and done. So let me take another one here. Says, Abna, can you know that even though the government has a law not to borrow over 5%, um, he has strategically and inherently, you know, the, I, I'm not sure I'm getting this. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not quite clear. Let me go to the last one here. Uh, good morning to you, please. I think our leaders have to be very serious in building our database. I think if this is done well, it will lead Ghana to a good development process. And that's Haruna, Peggy, and Tamale. There are a number of messages coming through, but I think I'll pull the brakes on them here and go to Dr. Dunford, because you wanted to react to something. But lastly, I think we need to touch on the fact that this budget was conspicuously missing imposition of taxes. And question is, of course, it's good for the Ghanaian because you don't want to be saddled with debt. But question is, in view of how we're doing with our revenue, you know, generation over the years, looking at, uh, you know, the, 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 the historical antecedent, if you like, was this an expedient decision for political purposes or that, indeed, we've come to the point where we are moving from taxation to production? <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. And uh, so the, uh, the, we've always been talking about the government creating enabling environment. The, the discussion here has always been that these days uh, government shouldn't be in business, but government should rather create the enabling environment for the businesses to thrive. And that is why I, one, why I like the free, I mean, one district, one, one factory, factory concept that is a more of a private sector led you know, I mean, agenda, and it is very good. Now, um, Dr. Mensah talked about the fact that policy rate is the only rate, is, is the only, it's not. yeah, you know, pushing the lending yeah. rate. I, I beg to differ. I mean, I don't think that is uh, what is the case. Uh, bank risk ratio, for example, is very, very I mean, important here. Yeah, because that talks about if, uh, if, if the banks are giving out the money and people are not able to pay, you know, that gives them the sense. For example, if the bank risk ratio happened to be one point, uh, at seven percent, and that I think the lowest we, we had was around 2004. Mm. What did we see at that time? What it meant was that if the banks gave out 100 uh, loans to 100 people, only two of them were going to run away. What did we see? The banks were moving uh, from one house to house, they were encouraging people to sure. come and take. You know, now the bank risk ratio hovers around 14 percent, and you are saying that that is not important. I mean, it is important. Sure. 
you know, and so I beg to differ from the right. Very well. And That's so, the second time you are begging to differ. So that's fine. And then, <laughs> yes. and then another thing that we were also talking about. I'm the revenue. taxation, I think we should look uh, at no, that. No, I mean revenue. When we talk about revenue, you know, we need so much that our expenditure has almost double within, um, you know, three years. And so when people, when we are saying we are not meeting our revenue targets, it, 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 it leaves an impression that we are not doing well at all with the um, revenue. Something which I, I don't mm -hmm. think but that's But we set the targets. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so if, if yeah, that yeah, so that revenue is growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in nominal terms, I don't normally yeah, want don't to talk in target. nominal figures, but within the um, last three years, because um, inflation has not been so um, phenomenal, when I use the nominal figures, I don't think I'll be too wrong. Three years ago, I mean, I'm talking about 2016, the total, I mean, revenue was 34, I mean, you know, billion Ghana cities, you know. Uh, the following year, 2017, we went to 43. But earlier, if you go back to our history, almost every year, we were increasing by 2 billion. And so all of a sudden, we move away from 34, 43, 49. And this year, we were looking for 58, but we say we will get 50, I mean, 54. So you, if you see, it's, it's a giant leap. And so if we say that investment is going in there and it's not yielding anything, it doesn't, it's not something that okay. I will support. Right. Uh, we are, we, we are, maybe we are not getting enough to match the ever increasing expenditure. expenditure. That is, I mean, the, 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 the you know, the situation. Okay. I yeah. think I'll so, take the taxation so question. I'll move it yeah. to Dr. Yeah. Sarkozy here yeah. because you've had yes. And then we'll be wrapping up here in the yes, next, yes. I think, five minutes. You can talk about yeah. free SHS, and but the, and the, the tax, the tax bit and the position, yes. Yeah. So the free SHS, uh, we have seen results, an increment in enrollment by 43%. I am not saying that when you want to target, it's all wrong. Mm -hmm. But the data, there's, we don't have that data to do the targeting. The fact that we don't have the data to do the targeting does not mean you shouldn't start. that you shouldn't start at all. You see but where are we the even making is. an attempt to get the data? Are we doing that simultaneously yeah, that, that as we go? Yeah, that's up to them. That, that is up to them. But we are, we are discussing the free SHS, the impact, the socioeconomic and political impact of that. But then the and, sustainability and the resource, is also key. I'm coming. The resource is showing mm. that it's something good. And I have demonstrated to you that... The, the labor force, the people that you want to grow your GDP. Should be of a certain kind. Yes, yeah. only 20% have SHS and above. In any case, let's look at subsidy for education versus social benefits. The government is subsidizing tertiary education. The fees that the private students pay from Ashasi University and Central University is much higher than the fees they pay at Legon. And that fee is subsidized. Government has subsidized. In fact, the government pays lecturers. Central University, the owner pays the lecturer. But government pays lecturers. So the subsidy infrastructure, subsidy in the, 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 the graduate students, even the graduate students, both masters and PhD, the thesis grant, bursary, and nobody is talking about that. Mm. But when government brings free SHS, then it is causing fiscal instability. Now, the social, it is in the literature that the social benefit of basic education and secondary education is higher than tertiary education. D definitely so, it yes. is. But we're so, looking so at how sustainable that would be too. And we're trying to get a sense I've of how a, we can get that. You I have, understand? I have made my point. Sure. I have I made my get point it. That, that education is Three also a capital investment. It's mm -hmm. also a capital investment. Sure, definitely. So we need the labor force sure. to be educated. Very well. Imagine, imagine the food vendor. Imagine the, the bus conductor. Imagine, imagine the taxi driver have SHS, the hygiene in the food, with exactly. the food vendor. Let me come to the last one, the, the taxation to production. I was going to move that to the West. The, the, the I, I'll, I'll touch on it. I, I'm, I'm leaving, so I'll touch on it. <laughs> Clearly, those taxes which were abolished in, the, in, in 2017 okay. were really nuisance taxes. The Lafa curve shows that those taxes should have been abolished in the year 2014. Now, they were abolished. We've lost some revenue in those seasons, but production has picked up. I am not saying that everything is good and we are in heaven. No, but we have made some progress. Yeah. And these are the figures. These are the figures. The production, agri-production growth rate has increased from 2.9% to 6.4% But that, but, 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 uh, well, I mean, compared to 2018, 2019 didn't do so well. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, no, no, okay, no, no, mm -hmm. you, are, you are wrong. Even a great 4.8 in 2018, mm -hmm. and it is estimated to reach 6.4 by the end of 2018. By the end of... I'm coming. Industry has picked up from 4.3% in 2016 to 8.8 .8 in 2019, expected to reach 8.8 .8 in 2019. Services, 
2.8, expected to reach you know 5.4. So the data is showing that some progress has been made. So I am not saying that everything the the economy has transformed right. and everybody is looking good. Sure. I am not saying that, but but, the, but you there's think some, we're making progress. The, but there's a result well. to, the to east show side that. Here. So I, I, I'm leaving you with the taxation to production uh, uh, thing. Is, is that what we're seeing with yeah. the absence yeah. of? new taxes or increased taxes in this 2020 um, um, budget, or it's just for p political uh, gains, if you like. Yeah. It's an expedient measure to take. Yeah. And think, we, we, uh, we can do that in uh, a minute, yes. and then Dr. Lord okay. Mensah has I, a minute I, I as well. Think, I think for the past few I think, years, uh, three years, um, you, could, you, you could conjecture from the posture of the current government mm -hmm. that um, um, their intent is to sway from the normal tax oriented economy to a production oriented economy and I think the argument boils down to how to generate revenue mm -hmm. okay and I was I was so much pleased with the strategies that are put in place to ensure that that is my main headache normally when you have problems the most important thing is to find solution exactly now how do we solve the problem? how do we make our economy a productive oriented economy here we are when we needed so much investment in this sector Contemporary tax collection. It's not like the you know the, the, the olden days where we knew each each and everyone. I mean physical collection. No, we've, we've stopped that. And I'm so much happy that um, the the issue of collecting revenue has is, is, is going digital. Um, we we need to get to the stage where the issue of widening tax net will not be a matter of. Uh, I mean, semantics. A long, okay? long standing. No, not, long standing. Not, 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 they shouldn't be semantics, but right. we need to operationalize it. And how do we do that? Now, people are now living in the digital world. So if I want to tax, that is one of the main, I mean, basis for really reaching out to the average income earner to also contribute towards the development of this yeah, country. But this whole digitization thing has been going on, but still we are not meeting no, 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 that. No, 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 so no. I think this particular government has been able to invest so much in that. I mean, look at the the conversion of the you know the manual system in the port mm. to automation. And today, we know the, the, the team numbers have been introduced. And now, yeah. the major work has to do with how to tax the online you know, operations. In fact, there are number of shops registered at the Western General Department which have no physical existence. Yeah, we need to work on that, but of course, and, and, uh, and, and, too, and too bad really I would have want to move to reach on. out to them, then you need right. to join them over there. Very well. Right. To, to, thank you, but too yeah. bad I have to cut you short there. But to Dr. Lord Mensah, your concluding remarks here. Yeah. No, I'm not. Am I concluding? Yes, you are. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yes. Right. I mean, uh, uh -huh. you know, um, <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, taxation exactly. to production. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I think uh, we are on course. Okay. Yeah. But to transform an economy from taxation to production, it doesn't come overnight. We shouldn't expect it will happen within four years. No. Now, if you talk about no tax in this current budget, I see tax, but it will come somewhere next year in the review because the government has sensed that the e-commerce, right? E-commerce. Yeah. It's the, the, the hallmark now. Yeah. And this the, is what you're the, saying. Yes. Yeah. And they accept that that is the global trend now. Mm -hmm. And you could see investment going into digitization. Mm. And so therefore, the government cannot afford to avoid taxes in those areas. Yeah. And so going forward, I presume by the next year, middle year review, the government will introduce some taxes in there. Right. But Ghanaians will not take it light. Because it's an election <laughs> we'll wait, we'll wait yes. for that day. But um, this is, this is where you... <laughs> no, 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 what do you want to say? Free as it is, 30 seconds, please. That is all I'm giving okay, you, 30 so, seconds, then we'll uh, go. Talking about the free and SHS thing that people are making so much noise about, oh, if you ask me, it. I think it is very, very um, important. You know, uh, my brother here mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, the data... Uh, I mean, we it's have not now. available to yeah, it's not telling the us that It's not telling us that if you meet every 100 adults, only 15 of them have completed secondary school education or higher. At OECD, I mean, countries, I mean, American, Europe, and the other places, it's over 90%. Right. You That's know, true. and so we are, we are far away. And last July, um, World Bank said that our uh, human capital index, um, the score is 44%. Sure. And that, when, if your score is um, 44%, it means that 
the, in the next 18 years, the next generation of Ghana has already lost 56% of its productive capacity. Right. We so hear you don't you. wait. Thank you. We hear I you. don't wait at all. Public Thank you so much. The, the, I mean, the, the public debt can dog. may threaten the bank economic stability. That's fine. So we need to deal with it. Sure. Yeah. That's fine. Thank I think you. I think you, you chipped that in really Thank well. You Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, let me say <laughs> thank you to my guest, Dr. George Dunford, Development yeah, Economist and Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Social Policy Studies, University of Ghana. Also, we've had Dr. Edu Ususa Akode. He's a research fellow at IFS. Dr. John Kweku Mensa Mauta has also been with us. He's the Dean School of Graduate Studies at the UPSA and Dr. Lord Mensah is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. Thank you gentlemen uh, for being here. We'll be back to look at the upcoming 17 December nationwide referendum. Welcome back. This is still The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. Just gone by was a conversation that looked at the 2020 budget and matters arising. Now we're turning our attention to matters involving local governance where um, we are going to be discussing the upcoming 17 December 2019 nationwide referendum, which is going to ask the question whether or not we would want political parties to sponsor candidates at the local level elections. And in the studio with me are, um, from my extreme left, we have Mr. Martin Pebu. He is a private legal practitioner. Next is Madam Josephine Inkrumah. She is a chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE. And to my right, we have Dr. Eric Udru Osai. He is the Dean, Institute of Local Government Studies. Good morning, lady and gentlemen. It's good, good to have morning, you. Good morning, have nice. Good. So this very um, interesting <laughs> developing matter around the upcoming uh, referendum. It's gaining traction. I think that debate, yes or no, is you know raging on, and a number of stakeholders or interest groups have issued statements here and there. Uh, we are trying to understand exactly what it is we are looking for as a people, what ultimately would be in the best interest of the country. I will start with you, madam. Ladies first, they say. Yeah. It's not often that I have <laughs> ladies on this, this show. So when, eh? Oh, well, for a good cause. <laughs> so, madam, uh, it's good to have you. Thank and you. Um, you have issued a statement, yes. the, the NCC, signed by um, the Director of Communication and Corporate Affairs, Mrs. Joyce Ifutu. And it is headed, Correction of Misinformation on the Facts of the Upcoming 2019 National Referendum. So clearly, you had cause as an NCC had cause to put out this statement because of what you found to be a misinformation or miscommunication about the whole process. Yes. Now, tell us what that misinformation is and then the correction about that. Well, um, NCC, as you know, has been on the ground um, educating the citizens on the upcoming district level elections and um, the national referendum. But the feedback we kept getting from most people was, oh, it's on the election of MMDCs. Uh -huh. And then to add to it, you found or you heard similar statements made in the media space. In fact, you had even high personalities in office equally making statements to that effect. So we realized that if we didn't put out a statement that corrected uh -huh. this um, misconception, in fact, on the day, December 17, people would very well go to the polls and find that the question that they were anticipating to answer is not at all the question. And that in itself too can be a backlash for mm. all of us. So as an institution that is supposed to educate, we thought it necessary to bring out this statement, to issue a statement, correcting the facts as is, and allowing people then to make an informed decision based on accurate facts. Sure. So what do you say to people who are saying that, well, this is a good statement to put out there, but perhaps it could have, the NCC could have been more proactive to ensure that this perhaps wouldn't have been even necessary? Because right from the get-go, sensitization would be, you know... Right from the get-go, right from the get-go, 
we were putting out the correct facts. Right from the get-go, when we realized and observed that some media houses... So what could have... What could have as motivated, or not motivated, but led to this miscon misconception or misinformation? It is because, you see, I think largely we all understand that there's been a clamor for people, by the people, to elect their MMDCs. Right. It goes way beyond even 2011, the Constitutional Review Commission's mm -hmm. report. So there's clear evidence that suggests that Ghanaians want to elect their MMDCs. So when people begin to tie the process of what is going on in Parliament, and link it to the referendum, there is a, a certain assumption uh -huh. that then what the referendum is, uh, is about is actually the election of MMDCs. Right. So I think there was that underlying desire by the people. And so they're creating their own question, as it were then. Yes, and people were... People <laughs> it's such were, your own exam question. Yes, and I think based on that as well, you had a few mischievous people who thought, mm. then let's capitalize on this and say that... Um, the referendum is about the election okay. of MMDCs, which clearly is not the case. Right. And yeah. I, I mean, when you look at the Afrobarometer, they are saying that about 60% of Ghanaians are unaware of the referendum mm. in itself. I think um, the Afrobarometer report was, um, the survey was carried out between September 16th or so and October 3. Mm. Now, we kick-started the intensity of our education and awareness raising on September 17th by the kind sponsorship of the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. But prior to that, we were engaging the citizenry on the district level elections and the referendum. But it intensified after that because we had received funds for that. So some data from the Afro would have been collected and informed. Yeah, so so in fact, we are even thinking that it is the, the education prior to that, that actually boosted it about oh, that it could have been worse. It could have been worse. Mm. So I'm sure that if another survey is carried out today, it would be a different picture altogether. Mm. 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 Right. Now, um, Doc, yes or no? <laughs> uh, yes or no? The campaigns are, you know, vibrant. And uh, to, 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 to muddy the waters even more is this recent position taken by, you know, the NDC, and of course, not too long ago, I believe just yesterday or so, uh, um, a letter from the National House of Chiefs which went vi viral, and of course, the attendant issues coming out after that too, we, we will definitely discuss it. But what do you make of these, if you like, last minute um, posturing of certain interest groups or stakeholders? Thank you very much. I want to believe that people from the one did not understand what was happening. Um, there is a difference between district assembly elections and the selection of MLDCs. Right. District assembly elections had to do with how we get the people there to serve at the district assembly level. Mm. The MMDCs constitute one of the groups of people to be selected at the local government level. The election of MMDC is one aspect, like I said. That is governed by a different article. That is not in the hands of citizens. Mm -hmm. Amending that article is in the hands of parliament. So at the moment, it is with parliament mm -hmm. to deal with it. Having amended that article, the question then is, how do we then move forward towards electing them? Are we going to elect them on partisan or non-partisan basis? That is where the citizens comes in. Mm -hmm. And that is what the referendum is all about. But initially, I think people had the impression that the referendum was to elect MMDCs. Mm -hmm. Having got the understanding and the clarity now, people are taking positions. Mm -hmm. It is good for people to take positions. Democracy is all about discussions. But what all of us need to do is to explain the issues to people to allow and uh, allow them to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Constitution Review Commission's recommendations, the first recommendation on the mode of district assembly elections, they recommended that Article 248 of the Constitution be amended right. to empower Parliament at any time in future to make provision for partisan elections mm -hmm. at the district and sub-district level. Mm -hmm. The white paper issued by the, the government, government rejected that position. And let me quote from page 33 of the white paper. It is saying that the government does not accept the recommendation that Article 248 of the Constitution be amended to 
to empower parliament at any time in future to make provision for partisan elections at the district and uh, sub-district levels. Government, therefore, government is of the view that the argument advanced by the commission for non-partisan local government system far outweigh, this is government speaking, mm -hmm. outweigh the arguments in favor of the partisan mm -hmm. local government system. Government, therefore, intends that Article 248 in its present form must be retained. This is what government said about the district assembly elections. Now, on the election of MNDCs, the commission recommended that chief executives must be elected in metropolitan and municipal in metropolitan mm -hmm. assemblies. But, and this is what government said. Government does not accept the recommendation that parliament should be empowered to determine specific mechanisms for choosing MMDCs. Government does not also accept the recommendation that in metropolis municipals or, or in metropolis, sorry, chief executives should be properly elected. The long and short of it is that they are saying government thinks that Article 2431 should be amended for the president mm -hmm. to nominate a minimum of five persons who will be vetted by the Public Services Commission for competence after which three nominees would contest in the public election. My point is that it is decision-making time. Do we allow political parties to take part in local level elections or not? Mm -hmm. Citizens must vote on it. But the arguments that are coming suggest that people are taking positions. And I am not surprised about the position taken by the National House of Chiefs. Why am I saying that Article 276 bars chiefs from actively participating in politics? Mm -hmm. So anything that sought to introduce political party participation in local level elections, that would exclude them from putting themselves up. Naturally and reasonably, they may uh, go against it. So for me, the statement does not change anything. I need the ordinary Ghanaian to be very discerning. Look at what is happening in Ghana. Look at how they want our democracy to be to take their decision. Right. But on the National House of Chiefs position, in fact, I, I did listen to an interview by one of the chiefs who raises issue with the process of even issuing that statement, right. and which has the effect of impugning that statement, actually. So to the extent that, well, we could not even perhaps rely well, on that as that. coming from the National House of Chiefs. Well, that is something that ought to be resolved, you know, at, at their level. But let's look at Article 2482. That's right. Which is what the Constitutional Review Commission, Commission had, 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 had recommended yes. for amendments Amendment. subsequently or at a later time by Parliament. It has the same effect as Article 55.3. That's right. And Article 55.3 is what is currently going to be the subject of, of the referendum. referendum. Now, there are those who are saying that if you get people to vote in respect of 55.3, and 248 is not dealt with, you probably would still have an inconsistent situation in the Constitution, which is that, you know, 2482 would prohibit, and then you have 553 or the amendment of 553 allowing. So you would have an unwieldy situation to deal with. So question is, why don't we have Article 2482 before Parliament, just as we have 2431? Okay, I think I've heard that argument too. But the Ministry of Local Government developed a roadmap. Mm. The roadmap supporting the entire process. The roadmap has identified a number of consequential amendments. The 55.3 is the most difficult one. Because once the, it goes into the hands of citizens, you need citizens to approve or reject it. Once they reject it, then you don't come back to 248. But if they approve it, then as part of the consequential amendment, you take 248 on board. And it is not only 248. If you permit me, when they are on page Even still eight, 243. Yes, on, on page 8 of the, um, of the uh, referendum, the Ministry of Local Government referendum, they have outlined a number of consequential amendments, mm -hmm. which in February 2020, they would initiate, subject to how the referendum mm -hmm. goes. And the first one is Article 248. That amendment bill for Article 248 and the Local Government Act should be sent to Parliament for approval. But that would depend on how the uh, amendment to Article 553 would go. But, but, Doc, sorry to cut you, but to the extent that we have 2431 before Parliament. That's right. Why didn't we go with 2482 as well to deal with it at a go? Because in, the, in terms of sequence, some have argued that 
55-3 being the most difficult, like you said, then perhaps we should have subjected that to the referendum first. And depending on the outcome, we now come to 2431 and then those other consequential amendments. But here's a case that we've started with one consequential, well, should I even say it's a consequential mm -hmm. amendment? It's not it's because not, no. we haven't yet done it's this. Exactly. So for now, it's the main. Mm -hmm. We started with that. And then we'll go back to the most difficult. And then depending on how the most difficult goes, we'll go back to another consequential. Mm -hmm. the, the, so it's a bit unwilling. Yeah, no, it's not. That is, you see, when you look at it from that point, then it, you are trying to say that the two are the same, the two issues are the same. But we're dealing with two different issues. Election of MMDCs is different from introduction of partisan politics in local level elections. Yeah. 2431 is in parliament because of election of MMDCs. Okay. In fact, we can go through 553 without even, uh, we can, in fact, once 243 is passed, whether 553 goes yes or no, chief executives will be elected. Yes, but not on partisan But not on partisan basis. So the 243 went to parliament because of election of MMDCs, sure. which, is, which is different from partisan, mm -hmm. uh, duration of partisan politics mm -hmm. into local government mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, 243 is for election of MMDCs. Let us treat it as an isolated item. When we finish, the question then is, do we need uh, politicians in our local government elections or not? Mm -hmm. That is dealt with by 55-3 and 2481. Mm -hmm. Question then is, of the two, which of them is difficult? You go for the referendum. Once you are done with the referendum, then you do the consequential amendment to 248. Okay. Let me, let me go to uh, mm. Martin Kwebu here mm. for your take mm. on the sequence of things and what you make of it. Oh, okay. I have my preliminary comment. I must say that I'm very excited that uh, so many uh, parties and factions, of, uh, or let me say segments of our society, are joining in the, our no vote campaign. <laughs> yeah, very, very exciting. So right but there, you've, 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 you've indicated yes, what you said. Yes, of course. We had this program, we had this debate <laughs> on yes. the 8th of April, yeah. right here. I told you right away that, look, me, once majority of the citizens whom the... Uh, Constitutional Review Commission consulted indicated that they want the uh, this, uh, the elections at the district assembly and also the uh, this, uh, appointment of the uh, MMDCs and all that should remain nonpartisan. I want to go with but it. But you see, senior, the word there was substantial, not majority. No, they said majority. It says okay. forty nine, paragraph forty nine, yes. at page four seven zero. Yes. Submissions received. It says mm -hmm. the commission received substantial submissions mm -hmm. that argued for the retention of the nonpartisan nature of the district assembly elections. And then when you go to mm -hmm. paragraph fifty, it says there was also a large number of persons. Yes. So. As whether or not the word was majority really was a majority. Oh, so it's like there is. Please, two look competing at, sides. Look at 47. The <laughs> no, but wait, wait. Let's look at 47. 47 okay. says that uh, a majority of Ghanaians called for the retention of the non-partisan character of those elections. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 47. It says majority. Mm -hmm. Majority is very clear. <laughs> so they are just saying and that... An equally yes. large number. Yes. Yes. Number yes. Number yes. Yes. An equally large yes. number. Yes, I'm not by you and I you the majority. know that okay. in interpretation. When majority. it's a majority, majority, <laughs> there's sure. no ambiguity. Right. It means it's that... Equally. Uh, no, but equal is not the same as majority. Mm -hmm. It says and majority equally. of the uh, mm -hmm. this respondents said that the elections and everything should be non-partisan. Right. So mm -hmm. that was case closed. And you know, we spent so much money on the Constitutional Review Commission's work. They went around the country, the phone lines were open. I remember doing the phone line, uh, there's some voting, text message. You vote one question, then they go next, next. So we spent so much money. Why do we come back and say, let's go again to do a referendum on the same questions? Ghanaians have already voted that, look, this, uh, this, uh, this assembly uh, arrangement should be on non-partisan basis. Case closed. Let's not reinvent the What do you say to Doc's response but, but, that there was but, a white but, paper? But, but, but Martin, you see... Case is not closed. Mm -hmm. Case is not closed because right citizens express their views. Mm -hmm. The commission made different recommendations from what the citizens said. Mm -hmm. The white paper also made a different acceptance. Mm -hmm. So the question then is, which of the documents are we using? We'll go Technically, citizens. in law, citizens no, are sovereign. We, we go are with citizens. We, view. Said we want no but the constitution. But by the constitution, yes. the we should paper. go with the white paper. Oh, no, but that's the problem. But, you see, that's but, why we should go back to the citizens mm -hmm. and ask them. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it to be a waste of time. Look, this referendum will be a waste of time and resources. Look, I think that Mr. President should listen. He's shown that he's a very listening president. Okay. <laughs> 
citizens have shown that, and especially with the NDC and the National House of Chiefs, joining our no campaign vote. Yes. Mr. President should listen. Let's call off the referendum. Let's just go at 243 that, look, this thing should, that's the parliament should amend Article 243 yes. to say that mm. MM, uh, this in the district uh, chief it should executive. Be elected. Elected. That's all. Let's well, just be simple. Now that you that's bring it. in the president, let's listen to him as he was urging people to vote yes. So let's, let's listen to the president. <laughs> For the yes vote on the 5th, 17th of December. And we want to take Ghana one step forward. We're making progress with our democracy on many fronts. This is one of the last remaining barriers that we have to overcome. Support the initiative that the government has taken to bring greater and greater control over local government to the people in the area. No longer do you have to complain. How come the president has brought us this man we don't like? Or this man we don't know? Now you can choose for yourself directly the man or woman you want as your district chief executive. Okay, so again, after listening to the president urging yeah. people to vote yes, let's go back to the CRC report. Yeah. Okay just to understand their thinking of the two positions, retention yeah. of the nonpartisan as against, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, switching to. Mm -hmm. So it says here, paragraph 49, that mm -hmm. the commission received substantial submissions that argued for the retention of the nonpartisan nature of DA elections. Mm -hmm. They provided the following reasons in support of their position. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just want us to go through it to see if really... The way you finish, you read the oh, recommendation of the no commission. One. Definitely. And then you look at the white paper. De <laughs> That's their recommendation. So, the white paper, you see, there's a problem. Is that <laughs> the reason for those saying let's retain the nonpartisan yeah. position is that the nonpartisan nature of local level, level elections enabled the local government units to build effective partnerships with civil society organizations to deepen democracy mm. and accelerate district level development. Mm -hmm. It says this is because CSOs are also expected to operate in a nonpartisan manner. Mm -hmm. Then B, politics in Ghana is very ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. Nonpartisan elections ensured that districts which are multi-ethnic are able to unite around one object of making social progress rather than be divided mm -hmm. along party and hence ethnic lines. And Excellent. then thirdly, the non-partisan character of the elections facilitated the mobilization of the people, creates an environment that is conducive for public consensus and removes the acrimony associated with partisan elections. These factors are crucial to the development efforts at the grassroots level, only which can lift our communities out of the quagmire of poverty in the midst of plenty. It looks like this C is the main thrust mm -hmm. of persons mm -hmm. pushing for the mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. We need to take a break. When we come back, we will get into the minds of those who are saying, yes. let's have a nonpartisan character. <laughs> and then we'll go and look at the white paper yes. and try to understand exactly what it is we're looking at here. This is the key point. Stick and stay with us. We'll be right back. Vote yellow for the yes vote on the 5th, 17th of December. Anymore? Well, welcome back. <laughs> well, um, we are looking at the upcoming national referendum, which is going to ask the question around Article 55.3, whether we as a people would want to have political parties um, sponsor candidates um, at the local level um, elections. And that's what we are currently discussing. So before the break, I read from the Constitution Review Commission report um, the reasoning behind those people who were advocating the retention of the non-partisan nature of district assembly elections. There were three of them. I'm now going to turn to the arguments for those advocating the non um, the review of the non-partisan character, which is to make it partisan now with the involvement of political parties. So paragraph 50 of the report reads um, that there were also, uh, or there was also a large number of persons that called for a review of the non-partisan character of district level elections. They backed their position with the following reasons. A, the implementation of decentralization by devolution would be impracticable if political parties are not allowed 
to participate actively in elections at the district level. Since the main objective of political parties is winning political power, the decentralization of power must involve political parties at the level where real power is located. B, the introduction of partisan politics at the district level would ensure that political parties that lose national elections can still maintain control of some districts and stay relevant to the business of governing the nation and extract benefits for their followers. This partisan presence can ultimately ameliorate in a sovereign way the polarization caused by the monopoly of a ruling party over both the central and local government structures in a winner-takes-all system. And see, partisan local government elections would allow district assemblies to be used as training grounds for national-level party politics. D, there is no compelling reason for barring political parties from taking part in elections at the district level. The restriction stems from the fact that the current system of decentralization was introduced at a time that political parties had been banned in Ghana. The system was then replicated in the constitution without much debate. And the last two um, says one is that in practice, political parties clandestinely sponsored candidates for district level elections despite the constitutional ban. It is time to allow the law to conform to the practice. And lastly, local government elections are used to gauge the midterm performance of incumbent governments. And the best way to do this is to allow the district level elections to be run along partisan lines. Madam. What do you make of these arguments for and against? Well, it is an expression of people's views mm -hmm. in terms of whether we want to see multi-party democracy at the district level. Right. And of course, this really addresses, um, this is what the referendum seeks it's to about, address. Yeah. So it is for Ghanaians now, based on these reasons, this becomes the information you need to make up your mind mm -hmm. whether, in your view, you think that we'd like to see multi-party participation at the local governance level or not. It's, for me, it's simple. But I'd like you to read the recommendations of the CRC mm -hmm. based on this and see if those recommendations in themselves responded to, you know, the questions, the, 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 the findings the the, that were yeah, made. Really? So there's just one here for mm -hmm. this particular yes. you know, question. It says, recommendation for constitutional change, that's a paragraph 65. It says, the commission recommends the amendment of Article 248 to empower Parliament at any time in the future to make provision for partisan elections at the district and sub-district levels. Mm -hmm. So does there it, you go. So does it respond, does it address the many needs or the many um, findings that were expressed there? Mm. So that in itself becomes one of the issues that must be addressed. And then it is further compounded by the white paper. Mm. And as um, Dr. Odro has indicated, the white paper now becomes almost, uh, it takes on almost the force of some law. I mean, I'm using this not in a strict sense mm. of the word. But for us to say, the white paper overrides right. the but recommendations the here. And the white paper in itself rejected this. So the question is, did it address the needs of the people? And that is why we've come back to a referendum mm. today. That is why we are now asking again, how do we want to see this go? We elect our unit committee members, we elect our assembly members. Now, if 243 goes through, it means we'll be electing our MMDCs. Question, after we've elected, we've, we've agreed to elect our MMDCs, these three categories of duty bearers, how do we want the election to go? It's brought us back to the same question that was asked in 2011 and the same issues arising from that Constitutional Review Commission that is still sitting on the books and nothing, no, con no real constitutional reform has been done. So we are at square one. Square one. <laughs> Square one. Well, we need to get out of this. All the money one. spent, Seriously. all the time, the views of experts, the sovereign will of Ghanaians, all of that has stalled again. Right. And this referendum must go on to address this issue once and for all. Right. Doc. Yeah, I think uh, my sister has said it all. Ghanaians were asked whether they wanted partisan or nonpartisan. They give various advantages and disadvantages. And the commission itself was of the view that the advantages of non-partisan outweighs the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, <laughs> they recommended that in future, 
part, uh, parliament should make laws so that the local government system can be made partisan. Right. And the, 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 the white paper also rejected that particular recommendation. And Doc, and, 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 and sorry, just to add, in doing so, they didn't address 55-3. They did 55 was, was not so in there. Yeah. You know, so the government white paper also the rejected the recommendation of the commission that parliament can make a law also. to make local government system partisan. And that is the more reason why the government is saying, let's come back to the citizens. Because at the moment, government cannot go and implement the CRC, sorry, the white paper on the CRC. We got a white paper on the CRC. Rejected as on its that. own, rejected, rejected the recommendation of the uh, uh, commission. Yeah. Sure. You know, so government is saying, I'm coming back to you. Repeat what you told the Constitution Review Commission again to us. So that once you affirm a yes or a no, we go by that. Mm. Let me also mention that whether a yes or a no, once 2431, which is currently in parliament, is amended, chief executives will be elected. But a yes or no means... The process of electing the duty bearers, the three of them, assembly members, chief executive, and unit committees, would either be partisan mm -hmm. or non-partisan. In yeah. any case, if somebody wants to play politics with it, the MPP promised they were going to elect chief executive within 24 months in office. So if they really want to elect only chief executives, then amending 2431 would have been the deal. Then they would have achieved their objective. But I am of the view that going forward, we should re-examine the constitutional provision that gives the president the power to issue white papers on commission's report. Because that is where the challenge is. That question should be put to a referendum as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we decide what to do with yeah. it. In, 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 in any case, it's part of the executive chapter. Like that. So so the entire that, executive it's chapter it's is entrenched. So it is also a referendum the question. White ah. paper is in 280. Publishing is it, is it uh, white paper. Is it not uh, part of the executive? 280. Right. It, it, it appears it's not entrenched. So parliament can... Uh, oh, then, oh, then that's good for me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, so wow. it means that this white paper is giving us headache. headache it headache, is the headache, white headache. paper that has created yes. all the problems. Yeah. Well, if the white paper had accepted, mm -hmm. had accepted the recommendations of the Constitution Review Commission, we would have mm -hmm. moved on. Right. But now, the, the, the government is at a point of decision making. Mm -hmm. And it seems the white yeah. paper rejected the majority views of Ghanaians. You think, let me come back to Ghanaians again for them to express their views. No. Right. So what we can ask Mr. President to do is that, no, he should just w restore the sovereign will of the people, which is that, look, the people said, majority said they want the uh, elections to remain non-partisan. So he would just review the white paper. That's it. What is the constitutional basis? Um, oh, it's a government is a continuum. You find that your predecessor made a certain and, and, and white then a paper. And a, a succeeding government is not bound by Exactly. White paper so you anything. just restore that. Look, I hereby review the white paper. I'm restoring the wishes of the sovereign people of Ghana that they want the elections to remain non-partisan. Please. And that would be right. And let, what, let, what let, the let, president for Then we need to review the entire Adnan. white paper. Yes, exactly. Adnan. Adnan. But what we haven't said so far is, you see, you remember the monetization yes. of our elections? Yep. Mm. Huh? It's, it's yep. such a huge problem, the yep. corruption and everything. So please, we've learned enough from it. Please, okay. let's keep that out of the local governance mm -hmm. system. Right. Let's keep this monetization and the corruption and all that in the electoral process out of the local governance mm -hmm. system. Let's continue experimenting at the national level, the partisan uh, elections at the national level. When we perfect it, in future we can come back to this and say, oh, let's introduce it at the local governance level. But okay. for now, we are not ready. Right. Now, in response to that, I, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know, one, one of the reasoning behind the retention or no the review of what it pertains currently which is let's switch to mm -hmm. partisan is that um really and truly the reason why we have that the provision as it is now is because at the time mm -hmm. multi-party democracy was 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 not in existence or was but political parties not necessarily Sorry, political parties, that that's what it that, says here and so then there wouldn't have been the you know anticipation of you know having political parties participate at that level. Those that, who made that, that argument, that, yeah. Those who made that argument have not referred to our history. Remember that the CRC is saying that these are the arguments of those saying let's make it partisan. Remember, yes. mm -hmm. the CRC hasn't said it agrees. Sure. Those who made the argument was that, a flawed one. Huh? It, sorry, it was a flawed argument. Exactly, yes. very flawed because this is not the first time. Local governance didn't start in Ghana in 1988. No. 
And in any case, the 1992 referendum was for the reintroduction of political parties. Exactly. Right, into, exactly. Into, so, for good exactly. Reason. So, look at that now. We had it in the First Republic. District councils, urban councils, and all that. We had it in the First Republic. Right. We had it in the Second. So, those who say that uh, the argument was influenced by the fact that we didn't have multi party uh, this in democracy in Ghana, I, I think they are totally flawed. Right, sure. Yes, madam, you wanted to say something? Well, I. Or you wanted me to make reference to something? If you yeah. could just say so, I'll, I'll, I'll pull that up. But whilst I look for that which you want me to mm. read. The question then is, this, I mean, the no vote, if, mm. if, if the no vote should succeed, mm. that would be, that would send a strong message to, yes. let me, maybe political parties, but not just political parties, but to us as a people, mm -hmm. that this is really a rejection of how we've done our politics. Mm. Yes. Wouldn't that be the yes. message? I think it will be, a, that, that will be the message, and it will also clearly, um, indicate to political parties that they need to set up and regain that confidence and trust Ghanaians need in them to move this country forward. As it is now, we all know that when you go to the district assemblies, it is the way assembly members are um, elected. They, the political parties clandestinely do their own primaries. Mm -hmm. So you already find that intrusion of partisan politics there, even though the law, the constitution clearly prohibits that. So you see political parties acting with impunity exactly. as it is already. So for me, my, my take on this is this, we have, we have a roadmap. If we decide to go yes, the roadmap and the review of our national policy must put in clear mechanisms that ensure that the, those negatives of partisanship that we see at all levels is not further entrenched. How do you insulate our assemblies against this kind of negative partisanship? Mm -hmm. If we go no, then this, this clearly established clandestine um, activity going on by political parties. How do you sanitize the system right. so that we as a people now understand that political parties have no business in local governance? If they have no business in local governance, we must have rules and regulations that ensure they are properly and kept out. Yes, kept out, and they are punished uh, if yes. they participate in it. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, they are all citizens. And if the constitution bars them currently and they're doing it, why do we allow it for that to happen without punishing them for it? But so, this it, is what we would like to right. see. Isn't it interesting that, I mean, at, 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 during all these debates and discourse, you see the political parties confidently say it actually that well. Mm. We're doing it nonetheless. So, <laughs> yes, I, 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 I briefly. Yeah. That's you, right. you, see, you know the way two four eight prohibits this uh, partisan participation. You know what, senior? Please, let's hold on to that. We need to take a break. When we come okay. back, <laughs> we will continue. I'll come to you for you to yeah. make yourself. Please don't lose your, your train of thoughts yeah, because we need right. that very soon. So this is the key point. Please stick and stay with us. We'll be back to continue with our discussion on the upcoming um, nationwide referendum on the seventeenth of December, twenty nineteen. See you shortly. Welcome back. Um, this is still The Key Points, live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on my, our Facebook page at TV3 Ghana. So we're still looking at the um, December 17, 2019 referendum, the issues around it and how uh, best the country could be, you know, advanced or developed by reason of which votes, you know, we end up um, having at the end of the referendum. Just before the break, Doc, uh, Mr. People was speaking to the issue about how, you know, openly politicians yeah. are stating that indeed, despite the constitutional ban, political parties are actively involved <laughs> in the local level elections. And I, I thought mm. that that in itself smacks mm -hmm. of impunity and yes. it's something that should not be countenanced. Yes, ex exactly. So the point I was trying to develop is that those doing it, they should be careful. You know, Ghana, <laughs> it won't be long. Somebody will be suing the Supreme Court. Mm. So it's just better than now that we are discussing this, 
we kind of call it truth on that, uh, or not even just turn a truth. We, exactly, that's a, a better leaf. expression. Yeah. Exactly. Let's turn a new leaf because now that citizens have become very uh, mm. conscientized and are following, very soon they will be suing the Supreme Court because Article 248 says that don't do mm -hmm. partisan uh, this, uh, elections at the district uh, this, uh, level. Yeah, so if a, candid yeah. yes, if a candidate is putting some party colors on his posters and the rest, that candidate should watch out. That yeah. candidate should watch out because very soon somebody is going to sue. And that candidate will be used as an example because, you know, when uh, a suit is made in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has the power to make consequential orders under Article 2.2. So if you go to bed, maybe the person, the, f the thing the person may ask is that, oh, lawyer, is there any punishment yeah. for uh, using party colors in a district uh, assembly yeah. election? Yeah, even though they've not yet expressly stated so, and that could two, two, two the Supreme Court can make, can make consequential orders, and that can be very dark. Mm -hmm. So I'll call upon all those who have been clandestinely doing, and also openly, flagrantly mm. doing party and politics in that. Mm. Yes, they mm -hmm. should refrain. Right. They should refrain let, from that. Let combat. me help here. Mm -hmm. yes. Under the under section twenty seven of the <laughs> <laughs> political parties act. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, um, if if a party, a political party, is mm -hmm. is, is contravenes mm -hmm. the political parties act, mm -hmm. which in, which includes mm -hmm. uh, participating in local level elections, mm -hmm. they can even revoke your mm -hmm. license. Yeah. And then, uh, if you are not very careful, you mm -hmm. the candidate, you can be fined as well, mm -hmm. right. You know. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to see. So, so, so what we need to do is we should see Enforce. more enforcement mm -hmm. of. Wow, no, the laws are there. Mm -hmm. The laws are there. As, yeah. as, as they always are. Yeah. The issue has to do with them. Implementation. <laughs> yeah. no, right. They are going to implement. You, sure, know, the way, you know the so. middle class, off the, I mean, offset, you know, Madame was talking about the growing middle class, the way they are getting disenchanted with the chicanery of our politicians and all this. Look, Ghana is changing rapidly. So we should we'll watch our the point. Point. car class has to be very vigilant. They should right. turn over a new leaf. Okay. So now this this other issue is, I mean definitely you all three of you could, you know, speak to it. I, 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 I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the reasons why some people have called for the involvement of political parties at the local levels is that, you know, polit the the level of civic involvement mm -hmm. is low. Mm -hmm. Relatively low. Yeah. Turn out no. terrible and mm. all of that so they were arguing or the people who have some people who have advocated you know the involvement of parties um, and partisan politics there is that political parties by their nature mm -hmm. can mobilize people mm -hmm. and in that mobilization they will get more people mm -hmm. to, to get to participate mm -hmm. and so let's mm -hmm. bring them in mm -hmm. if our argument is that no given the acrimony at the national mm -hmm. level or the mm -hmm. central level, we don't want to see that replicated down there. Mm -hmm. We still haven't dealt with the issue about how to increase participation. or participation. Question then is, how do we get that? Because ultimately, that is what the essence of decentralization is about, see, having is, people. Mm -hmm. So let me throw it to okay. the lady, ladies first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the <laughs> essence of decentralization <laughs> in our assemblies is development. Mm -hmm. and at the very core of development is the participation of all mm -hmm. of us. Perhaps that has contributed to the developmental deficits we see in this country. Okay. And it's important for us to step up engagements of the citizenry to participate in district level governance. Because that is where I keep saying that is the essence of our comfort the essence of our daily living, and everything that occurs there affects all of us exactly. collectively. So we have to perhaps <coughs> begin to focus more on the benefits of decentralization, whether it's partisan or otherwise. At the end of the day, it takes people to develop. Mm -hmm. So we have to step up our engagement and people begin to appreciate. I say that our district level elections are even more important totally. than our general totally. elections. Mm -hmm. I ask people, totally. when was the last time you saw an MP mm -hmm. coming to your doorstep or the president coming to your village? Mm -hmm. But your assemblyman, mm -hmm. your unit committee member, your mm -hmm. DC, he's with you every day mm -hmm. and you should be concerned 
about what he is doing there. And in fact, our um, local governance act gives us so much access to these people, mm -hmm. so much access in, in actually um, observing what is going on, demanding accountability. And when we wake up to those rights that we have to access to participation, at the local government level, we would see the kind of development right. we want. And then people will begin to appreciate that. This is where I should be looking at. Right. Because the road I drive on, the exactly. kind of water that comes through my taps, the whether I have mm -hmm. um, a good medical facility in my electoral area, all mm -hmm. of those things touch the essence of my living right. every day. Right. And when we wake up to that you know reality yes when the light bulb actually comes on we would realize sure. that this is where we should be headed right. and this is what we should be involved sure. with thank you the district assembly mm. is the highest political authority at, um, the, at local, the local level mm, so mm. definitely they will yeah. that yeah, level of power and they can mm. do things if they really want to do it if people are involved there accountability increases and obviously we get development mm. as, as as we want but doc how do we get civic participation in the Enhanced. A lot of work for NCC. Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. The work of NCC. Yes. 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 How have we decentralized it? How have we sensitized people to appreciate and understand their role and all of that? For instance, people do not even know that they can recall the assembly member if yes. the assembly member is not performing. Mm -hmm. People do not know that the assembly would have to consult them before they finalize their development plans. People mm -hmm. do not even know that if the assembly finalizes their development plans and the development plan does not make provision for the electoral area, they have every right to challenge that particular development plan. You know, so all these things require education. And the recognized constitutional body is the NCCE. Mm -hmm. That institution is under-resourced. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling for a resourcing of the NCCE, mm -hmm. both financially and logistically, so they'll be able to deepen civic education, so that at least citizens will be able to understand and appreciate their rights and participate effectively in local government. Well. Doc, I thank you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to talk, sound like a broken record, but I have people like Doc advocating for me. Yes. Yes, so excellent. Definitely, yeah, we'll, so keep, me, we'll keep that advocacy going. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you know, in law, we say that I have nothing useful to add. Ah. <laughs> they do have put it well, but maybe I should just add a very uh, a decent, brief comment. I think that the middle class, those who drive to work in their mm -hmm. AC, say no, I don't want anything to do with politics. I think they are the people who should watch out. Yes. There are people who should watch out because, look, whether they like it or not, politics will affect them, the water they drink, the air, everything. Yes. So it's about time they sat up and got involved. By saying they should get involved, we are not asking them to be partisan. Sure. No, we are not asking them to be partisan. You can be political without being partisan. As we sit here, we are being political, but mm -hmm. we are not being partisan, yes. you see. So the middle class should sit up. They should sit up. Okay, then we can all help to make a very good country. Mm -hmm. good. Very well. Um, um, let me take some messages and then return to the panelists for their concluding remarks on this. Um, doctor, this one is Paul in Aflau. It says, Dr. Osai in recent past decried increasing spates of impunity and indiscipline in Ghana caused by political parties. Today, Dr. Osai is telling us that Ghanaians should let political parties take charge of the unit committee and assembly elections in our election areas. To what end? What is Dr. Osai's motivation? He wants more impunity and indiscipline in Ghana. Um, that's a question there. Um, I am there. This one says, I have served as elected assembly member in my village with 20 unit committee members from different political religious and social divides. It will be impossible for some of the people who served under me as unit committee members to win a unit committee member election on their political party tickets. I'm therefore voting a big no. Um, that's coming from former assembly member Duta Electoral Area. Good morning, Abna. Please let's vote a big no to reduce the political tension we have engraved 
um, on ourselves in this country. Uh, Makumba Inwa says, Abna, I will entreat every Ghanaian of, of voting age to go for a very big no for this impending referendum because we don't want our local election to be highly politicized as the national one. For example, we don't want to experience a highly tensed political year, highly monetized its electoral system, monopolized two political party system, etc. We can elect our local members without political party participation. That's Makumba Inwa. So, Clearly, I mean, if, I'm sure if people had the opportunity, they would also say no to <laughs> multi-party democracy at the national level. But hey, this is <laughs> what we have, so we, we, we are moving on. But um, in conclusion, let's look at the hurdles that government would even need to jump in terms of having the voter turnout of a certain percentage, and then that voter turnout, the about 75% percent no voting yes if government wants i mean that that the the change to happen so we have firstly to get people out there to vote and that i think you can touch on that as yeah. we conclude uh, on here uh, uh, okay i think um the ncc the information services department and the ministry of local government are on the field campaigning educating people so they will be able to understand the issues but the constitution requires that we need 40 percent turnout and then 75 percent of the 40 percent must vote in favor of the bill to amend article 55.3 so that is where we are now so the most important thing is people must come out in their numbers and express their view this is a civic duty this is a civic responsibility would we'll have to deliver it because in times past we've never gone past 45 percent mm. by way of voter tenor when it comes to local level sure. elections let us make history by this time around coming out in, the, in our numbers mm. to vote the, the way regional the organization had how, what percentage turnout that, like, that, that is not nationwide that was nationwide it, it, it wasn't nationwide, that was nationwide. Uh, right. it was organized in selected areas sure, sure. and that one has the unanimity of all the people sure, they the actually time. petitioned right. for it. Very so that well. you no, can't no, didn't So we have though. two minutes to go. I'll really? split yeah, that. Yeah, some people didn't <laughs> petition the commission of the regions. So your your, your yeah, concluding I remarks. As I think my there. concluding remarks, I would like to reiterate um, on the clarification so that Ghanaians understand that as you go to the polls December 17th, you're voting your unit committee members, you're voting your assembly members, and you're voting yes or no in relation to whether you want multi-party participation at the local governance level. And to understand that voting, mean, voting yes means that you want political parties to participate in district level go governance. Voting no means you reject the proposed amendment and you would not like to see multi-party participation at the local governance yeah. level. So the status quo remains. Anything to do with the election of MMDCs is clearly in the domain of parliament. parliament. And parliament is in the process of amending that. So the election of MMDCs, once it's amended in parliament, we would be able to elect our MMDCs. Now the question at the referendum, how do you want to see this election? Either you want to see it on a partisan basis or a non-partisan basis. So we, we, we ask and urge all people, I add my voice to my brother's voice and say, Ghanaians should come out in their numbers and vote. If you don't come out and vote, at the end of the day, it would be a wasted journey sure. for all of us. Come out and let's declare our full understanding and our full preference. commitment and preference yes. to this process. Let Thank your you. voice be heard. And it's color coded yellow for yes, brown for no. no. Mr. Okay. Martin, could we yeah. have the last I, mean, I, I, I hold a different opinion. <laughs> Uh, this I want to end. <laughs> I respectfully call on Mr. President, okay, the Electoral Commission, and all the powers that be that look, let's put a stop to the referendum. Yes, my humble plea is that let's put a stop to the referendum. Ghanaians were given the opportunity to vote when the CRC was doing its work. And they express their clear opinion that they want elections at the local level to be nonpartisan. So we don't need a sec a another referendum on this matter. You say, let's spend our resources in a better manner. We can use the money for these elections, yeah. okay? On roads, hospitals, schools, schools under trees, mm -hmm. okay? We have more pressing needs. So that the uh, easier thing is for the president to review the white paper and say, look, I would go with the sovereign will of the people earlier on expressed during the CRC sittings, where majority of the people said, Elections at the local level should be non-partisan. Well. So let's only do amendment of Article 243 for the election Which of Which is before DCs. Parliament currently. Uh, excellent. Very well. So that's Martin Pebu's um, advice to government. But if that doesn't happen, then the advice given by 
Dr. Odrosai and Madam Josephine Nkrumah is for you to go out in your numbers, go express your opinions, your preference, and let your voice be heard in respect of this very important question of participation of political parties at the local level um, 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 elections. So thank you very much, um, lady and gentlemen. We've had in the studio Mr. Martin Pebo, a private legal practitioner, Madam Josephine Nkrumah, she's a chairperson of the NCCE, and Dr. Eric Udrow Osai, Dean of Studies and Research Institute of Local Government Studies. Thank you so much, and thank you to our viewers and listeners for making a date with us. We'll be back here same time next week. Until then, have yourself a very, very good weekend and a productive week. Bye-bye.